Yeah. It's happening. It's here. It's alive. <laughs> it's alive. It's alive. <laughs> That's such a good movie. Have you seen that? Oh, the of course, one? yeah. Yes, the original. I love that film. I was going to say, my grandmother had, um, well, she still has, like, probably in storage. She has um, these big box sets that have um, for all the different, like, original like universal monster movies so it's like she had one for the invisible man she had one for dracula for um frankenstein for creature of the back black lagoon mm -hmm. uh wolfman um i say i've watched like i'm pretty sure i've watched every single one of them um because of that the... say again the uh, the original Universal monsters, yeah. I say it's so, God, yeah, they're so good. It's funny too because the Mummy is not, like, especially if you look back on it now, it's not really a horror movie. It's like a mm -hmm. romance movie. It's interesting too because now that I think about it, like the plot of the original Mummy movie reminds me a lot of um, Francis Ford Coppola's Dracula. Yeah. Um, where like in that the romance aspect is very heavily um emphasized and obviously there's the whole like reincarnated lovers aspect so it's kind of interesting now that i think about that right. yeah and the i We're mean the original about... no the original invisible man is more of like a dark comedy than a horror film you know what i mean it's I it, like with his, with his uh the way he like makes all these dark jokes after well, he messes with people, well, I was gonna say I think that's part of Claude Rains' performance because I don't, I don't remember that being a part of the original book. But God, yeah, God, God I love, I love Claude Rains so much. He's such a great actor. <laughs> it's like between, between that and like Casablanca, like yeah, God, it's just an amazing actor. Also in um, is also in the Wolfman as well. He plays um, Lon Chaney Jr.'s father. Uh, for his character plays the father of Lon Chaney Jr.'s characters. Hey, I, I know you like to fan cast the question. He would have been the question back in the day. Uh, wait, who who would have been? Uh, the actor who played uh, oh um, Claude Rains. Yes, Claude Rains. Oh, oh yeah, that oh god, that actually would have been really great. Yeah, I would have loved that. <laughs> He's used to not having a face. <laughs> no, I I really want to know how they did some of that stuff too with the um where he's like unraveling the bandages around his face uh. And you see like there's nothing in there. I really want to know how they did that. Because I mean, obviously, like it has to be like some kind of green screen technology. But I'd be interested to know like what the development of that was. Because I mean that was made in I don't think the war had ended at that point. Um mm -hmm. so they could very well have just painted him out frame by frame, yeah. you know? And then it would have been crazy. Gone for another pass, I don't know. Yeah. Um, no, oh. not the 2021. Oh God, yeah, nineteen thirty-three. Okay, so the war hadn't even started yet. That's crazy. Yeah, that's crazy. Okay, yeah, I really need to know how they did that then. Anyways, <laughs> we are, we're not here to talk about universal <laughs> horror movies, but that could, we can do that for. That another. could be a whole other podcast where we're in person uh, I would with totally each do other. That. Um, uh, we're here once again in the Zoom world because we don't want to get each other sick from that Rona. Uh, yes. Soon enough, soon enough, we'll be back uh, face to face. Exley and I, I'm Julius, and I'm here with Exley once again. Hello, Exley. How you doing? Good. That's a good, that's a good, uh, sorry, not to get off on the under tangent again. That's, <laughs> that's a really good, um, that's a really good Susie Sue song. Was it, that was in Batman Returns. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, yeah. uh, man. You don't even talk about, like, the music tie-ins with films from that era, like the, the 90s oh, era, you know, like the, uh, um, didn't they have like a P Diddy in Godzilla and uh, he was doing a song with um he was doing a song with Jimmy Page from Led Zeppelin cuz they were doing it was on top of Kashmir it was like one of these uh, it was I think it was either P Diddy or or maybe it wasn't P Diddy I don't know but it was a rap it was like a rap tie-in to Roland Emmerich's Godzilla and it was <laughs> I totally wouldn't that... be surprised if that was the case. Yeah, it was, it was pretty bad in the nineties. I will say though, Batman Forever has a pretty great, uh, has a pretty great like promotional soundtrack because it's got like, 
Hold Me, Throw Me, Kiss Me, Kill Me, which I'm not a U2 guy, but that song is pretty good. Mm-hmm. Um, you got I Kiss from a Rose. I have never heard of that, but it does have um, PJ Harvey, who I really liked as a kid. Like She was played a lot as I was growing up. I guess it has a, a Nick Cave song, um, which, funnily enough, I'm wearing a Nick <laughs> Cave team. TV shirt. Um, yeah, I was going to say, it's, it's not a bad... It's not a bad uh, it's not a bad soundtrack, but like uh, I just said, well, I, we're not here to talk about that. No, yeah. Just one last thing before we even talk about anything else. I know for a fact there's a Method Man uh, tie-in <laughs> song called The Riddler, I think. Yes. Because I remember the, the um, what's it called? The uh, music video where everyone from Wu-Tang is in like the gangster mob, you know, uh, Godfather meeting room. Oh. And for some reason... Uh, Method Man is in a fat suit as like the the mob boss, and it, and the beat sounds like like a slower down, darker version of the uh, Adam West theme, where it's like do 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 like that's the song. You should listen to it. It's a funny song, like an anti <laughs> like an anti nightcore kind of thing. That's yeah. Weird. Uh, but here we are actually we're here to talk about uh that, that we're, we're here to tol- tolerate comics because we haven't we in a in a bit you know it's been a while since uh we've done anything like that uh the comic book podcasting um uh life just got so busy near the end of 2022 yeah uh, ridiculously so um but here we are we're here to, for the new year we're here to talk once again about this comic book shit uh, there, there's plenty of stuff to talk about and plenty of things have happened in the past uh, months since we did a podcast about pod about, about comic books a podcast about, a podcast about podcasts <laughs> um, obviously one of the biggest things we're going to talk about uh, not right away because I like to build our way into into all that we're going to talk about uh, James Gunn's DCU because yes. I, I don't know if you know this but I think it was yesterday or today it was confirmed that a slate will be coming later this month. Yeah, I did see that. As someone was asking, like, hey, can I get this as a birthday present? He's like, it is a very late <laughs> birthday present for sure. So it'll be sometime, sometime between the 14th and 31st. So we'll see. Yes. Uh, and I look forward to it because I'm, you sure. know. Uh, before we even talk about what we want to see, what because we're going to try to each other, we're going to pitch what we think the first phase of this DCU will be. I'm very excited to hear what Exley has come up with. Um, before we even get into any of that, we got to talk about uh, some other comic book stuff, some comics we've been reading. And uh, I also kind of want to talk about the response Gunn has gotten and kind of he's he's an interesting figure now in terms of that side of pop culture yeah. uh, where he's gotten a very polarizing response from people. Of yeah. All sorts. Very, very polarizing, um, which I don't know if I'm surprised or not. Um, I'm not. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, it's like, I mean, one like DC fans are built different. Um, like we, <laughs> yeah. no, I mean, like we, like we, I think, I think we are. I don't want, like, I don't want to, or I would, I don't want to say, like, oh, like we care about our universe more than Marvel fans, but like, there, I do think there is a level of, um, there, there is a mismatch in terms of like the level of investment, um, in terms of just how fanatic, um, we are about dc compared to marvel um and some 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 marvel fans they, they get close to us but mm-hmm. i mean like i i just the i think just comparing the discourse around dc movies compared to the discourse around marvel movies online i think within the last this gun was announced as head DC it, Studios, i think it was like, last three. month or oh maybe maybe it was more than the last month i, think, I thought it was longer months. than that um, I don't know. Maybe time time flies. So I don't know. Yeah, it, um, it, I think it was right. It was maybe a couple months, or I'm sorry, a couple weeks to a month after Black Adam initially came out. Yes, and then, which would have been November. Yes, so it was pretty recent when this yeah came out. Yeah, 
Yeah, I think the from what, what you're talking about when it comes to the uh, discourse of DC fans, I think a lot of that, and, and the passion especially, I think a lot of that comes from those characters as a whole, as a majority, not getting the either uh, representation or respect in terms of the majority opinion. You know what I mean? Because yeah. While Marvel was making their universe and continues to, DC has, like, because of who's in charge or who was in charge, um, kept on falling and lagging and everything, you know. Uh, And and the majority opinion is that DC doesn't know what they're doing, you know, and that's unfortunate. Well, let me say, I mean, I don't even know if I would, I mean, it's not just an opinion. I would say it's kind of the truth. Um, I mean, part of, I think part of the, um, Part of the passion that you see in online discussions as well, I think, is part is also just a product of the fact that, you know, uh, if we're talking you know, solely about the Justice League, like, I mean, really up until a decade ago, like those like those characters were titan, were kind of titans of pop culture. Um, whereas like with um with the, with Marvel, you know, the big like the big heavy hitters were not the Avengers, you know, their Justice League equivalent. It was like I mean, not, it was like, not the fantastic, not the Fantastic Four, no. not after those horrible movies, but um, it was. Uh, I would say it was Spider Man and the X Men. Yep. Yeah, there was Spider Man and the X Men, um, which uh, I am not looking forward to. What <laughs> Disney Marvel is going to do with the X Men? I'm nervous about that. Um, but yeah, yeah, it was Spider Man and the X Men, um, and even then, like they, they really didn't have the same broad kind of pop cultural appeal that um a lot of dc characters had until um the the x-men films from the early 2000s um mm-hmm. i mean that i mean i remember like that was and i, I also remember because i'm young enough to remember this like i remember the craze around the uh, the the spider-man films i mean honestly like i don't and i don't know if it's still this way now um he's probably got a couple contenders in this respect but i mean Spider-Man probably was like Spider-Man was Marvel's Batman at that point. Um, yeah, for sure. And then I would, and this also touching on Batman, this also goes to DC not knowing what they're doing. Um, like they, they at this point, like they, I feel like they only really know how to market Batman, um, which is frustrating as a bat, both as a Batman fan and as a fan of like other DC characters, because I want to see them use other dc characters not just rely on batman um and again it i mean and we've talked about this before like i think the fact that they they only know how to use batman speaks to um speaks to the kind of um malaise the kind of cultural and spiritual malaise that has kind of set in across the entertainment industry where batman Mm -hmm. is he's easily the most cynical of like, in terms of like, like choosing uh, to produce something about the character it's like well, it's just, a cynical choice is that what you mean well yes but i mean like he is also the he's the most nihilistic um tonally of all of the different like big dc superheroes um that's interesting and i think, and I think there's a way it's amusing too because in some ways he's also kind of the most right wing um mm-hmm. but I think yeah, I think something about the something about the the kind of nihilism and the cynicism that has crept into Batman media post like Bronze Age, I think makes it easier for for the media to make Batman adaptations. Um because I think the kind of nihilism that inflicts American culture generally, I think is, I think it's more advanced among people in the entertainment industry. Um, yeah, I think that's part. That's part of why they only kind of know what to do with Batman. Um, that, that's that's interesting. The the point of nihilism that you speak of when it comes to Batman, because Batman as a character at, at this point is an institution in this country yeah. in the world oh, yeah. but but specifically in terms of western entertainment batman is something that you can guarantee it's like it really is like 
Jesus in that you can <laughs> you can rely on making a profit with Batman, you know? Yeah. And the it I think that only happens not only just because of, you know, I think the nihilism is is an interesting uh take on that. Um but I think because the character has proved to be so versatile over generations and takes, you know what I mean? Um the fact that we can have uh, because I, w while I was dealing with my COVID, I rewatched the uh, Christopher Nolan trilogy, and then yeah. I kind of uh, looked at what was going on with the uh, the the Pattinson Batman, you know, and and then you know you start going down the rabbit hole of takes, because like I think it's amazing that Lego Batman can exist whilst yes. uh, you know Pattinson exists out there as batman you know it's, it's interesting the lego batman movie i know people say it's supposed to be pretty good oh it is very good i love it's it's maybe it might be my favorite batman film since the nolan films really yes yes so not because of batman no because i even though and I was thinking about that after watching the Nolan trilogy. I was thinking about the uh, the Batman, the Robert Pattinson one, and and I was thinking about why it's not my favorite because it's a lot of people's favorite, not only uh, Batman film but just movie in the past couple of years, which I get. You know, I it's a very it's it's probably the most movie Batman movie. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it's, it's the most cinema Batman movie at least. For the last several decades like not since i think 89 mm. and we got on something that felt interesting like a comic book i think batman begins is is a is a debatable point with that i, I would probably agree with you um i think it's those three that feel the most yeah. like a comic book I um, uh, in the good way you mean because like yes. batman and forever and batman and robin feel like comic books but <laughs> well robin feels like a toy commercial for, forever, well, that's true. I, I agree. Feels like a comic book, but it feels like it feels like um, I don't know. Yeah, Forever's art direction is like a weird, like you can fe it feels somewhat silver age, but obviously like it, it also feels kind of bronze age. Yeah, I don't know. Like I mean, yeah, 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 yeah like, absolutely. See, eighty nine for sure definitely feels like, I and mean, it feels like something that um, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, it just feels a lot like you know. I almost feels. It feels a lot like reading like the Killing Joke. Um, I don't know. Yeah, I just re I get reminded yeah. of Killing Joke a lot when I watch that. But anyways, K Killing Joke mixed with I'd say the uh, like the Neil Adams, Denny O'Neill stuff of yes. Batman. You know, especially yeah. with the Joker's uh, look and everything. But yeah. um, uh, when it comes to the Batman, at least for me, now the uh, I don't speak for everyone, of course, but um, for me, it's not my favorite Batman film because it feels a bit redundant of other batman films in you know in what they uh, are focusing on and uh you know the the plot a little bit and i just it, there's there's more and i don't hate the movie at all i actually i enjoy the film but it's not my favorite batman film it is the lego batman movie is above that for me because i think it's a more interesting uh the, the character journey of bruce wayne in that is more interesting in my opinion I guess I'll have to watch the Lego Batman movie then. Got it, man. It's like a, he's having a midlife crisis when he goes into the bat, uh, the bat cave. He, um, his his password is Iron Man sucks. <laughs> it's awesome. <laughs> um, it's awesome. Uh, yeah, but so we've been uh we've been dealing with a lot of comic book stuff. A lot of stuff is coming out. Um, there was a trailer that came out. I think yesterday for the new ant-man film and i know that yes. you're not the biggest marvel fan and everything but have you seen are you a fan of the ant-man character at all uh no i am actually um it was, it was because i watched um earth's mightiest heroes the animated series um when i would have been in middle school i think when i watched it mm -hmm. um because that was and that was actually what introduced me to um to ultron as well um, and it was, oh it was, yeah, it was part of my. It was part of why I was so let down when Age of Ultron was released, and I was like, the, 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 "This, this, this is not Ultron. Where all the Man incest? Do that? Where's all the incest? You like you removed half of what makes his character interesting is that he wants to fuck Janet Van Dyne. Well, that's why Scarlet Witch was there. 
Because he for sure oh, wanted no. that. <laughs> no, I I wanted he should he should have wanted to fuck because it's Michelle Pfeiffer who plays Janet. Yeah. If you wanted incest in Age of Ultron, the closest thing that you got was Quicksilver and Scarlet Witch. Uh, let's not talk about that. <laughs> Yet another it's true, the Ultimate Universe. I, I, I mean, I, re- I remember messaging you like a few months ago because I was watching like video breakdowns of like the first like several issues, several dozen issues of the Ultimates. And it's just like, oh my God. Like To be fair, to be fair, that re- revelation, that specific re- revelation of Quicksilver and Scarlet Witch comes in the Ultimates 3 which was not written by Mark Millar. That was written by Jeff Loeb. That's surprising. So, Wait, so who is it written by? Uh, the book, star- The Ultimates, initially was written by Mark Millar, uh, yeah. who did, you know, Kick-Ass and everything. Um, Marvel 1985. Uh, <laughs> Jeff Loeb wrote The Ultimates 3, which included that. So That's very surprising that Jeff Loeb wrote that. I was like that. That's that totally feels like a Mark Miller thing to do. I know. I'm very surprised. I'm wonder. I'm wondering if this was like notes that Miller had left over. Be like, hey Jeff, do this now that I'm gone, or if that was a purely a Jeff Loeb decision. I'd be interested it, to know. It may it may have been a little bit of crossover because they they almost tease it. You know, when they first bring in those characters into the old yeah. Fits. But it they never like out and they never show, you know, they just make them seem like a weird sibling couple, yeah. you know, or not a couple, but like weird siblings. I mean, yes, couple, but it, well, it, it, that became confirmed at some point. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> but Jeff Loeb you, was the you, one. You know, it's a you know it's a Mark Millar book because everyone is a horrible prick. Everyone yeah. is a horrible prick. Yeah, ever especially um Hank Pym. Hank Pym is a legit monster in those books. It's it's awesome. Also, um, why am I forgetting Bruce's girlfriend? Oh, Betty Ross. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That was Betty. <laughs> Betty's kind of an asshole in the ultimate. Oh yeah, dude. She's she's completely awful. <laughs> yeah, every everyone in that book is a massive prick. I would say the only the only character I think in the Ultimates universe who is not a massive prick is Miles. Yeah, well, Miles and yeah, Miles is one or, or not one, I guess. And I would say also Peter Parker. He's if yeah. Peter's a prick in any way, it's in the way that a teenage kid is a prick. You know, yeah. um, but no, Peter's cool. Peter Peter's really cool. What when you were watching those breakdowns, what where were you watching them? Do you remember the channel? Was it comics no. explained or no? I don't. It may have been. I'm not sure. Um, it was on YouTube, but I could probably uh-huh. find it um, if I looked. Um, God, yeah, I don't. I'm not sure. I ever want. I ever want to read the Ultimates ever. <laughs> ever. The the first two books, the ult. I'm I'm looking at them right now. They're on my stack. Uh, the Ultimates and the Ultimates Two are mm-hmm. great. Awesome. Okay. Unironically. Unironically, yeah. I mean, there are some moments that are, that are dated because they were written in the early 2000s and everything, but they are... Uh, I love them. I love them. I love them. All right, I, all right. I'd give it a read, at least. Okay. It, it, it is the... also weird... Sorry, go ahead. No, no, please, please. I say it is also weird that um, uh, Norman... Because I, I, mean, I thought this is just how the Green Goblin worked originally. Um, uh-huh. I didn't realize it was a mess. That, like he actually turns into like a goblin. Yeah, and he looks like the Abomination. Yeah. It's very weird. Yeah, it's ultimate. <laughs> it's the ultimate goblin. <laughs> Godspeed, Spider Man. Godspeed, Spider Man. But uh, back to um, Ant Man. <laughs> yes, Ant Man does seem like the character of of the MCU that you would like the most you know what i mean or that you would have a lot of um uh affinity for no that would actually be iron man um oh okay yeah no that was um yeah no i think i mean you know he's dead now um but yeah yeah, i think um i think tony is actually the one that i enjoy the most um i still haven't seen the ant-man movies i think the only the only bit i've seen of um paul rudd's ant-man is um is in civil war and i was like I like I like him. Um honestly I'm still I'm still kind of sad that I didn't get to see um 
but I still didn't get to see a Hank Pym um, as Ant Man really. Um, but you know, I don't like. I don't hate. Um, what can I remember his name? Um, uh, Michael Douglas. Uh, no, 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 not. I mean, I love Michael Douglas. He's an amazing actor. Um, the second Ant Man. Oh, um, um, Scott Lang. Scott Lang. Yeah, Scott Lang. I like Scott as a character. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think um, I definitely like uh, I definitely like um, Hank. I think more. Um, well, in does... the yeah, in the movies they have a couple different uh, uh, scenes and stuff where Hank does uh, some Ant Man type stuff, even as an old man and everything. It's pretty yeah. cool, and it looks like in this new film they're gonna go in that direction of I him see, because have some stuff to do. Yeah, they're all in the quantum realm and they're facing off King and everything. And I I wanted to bring up it's the the arc that they've seemed to be stretching across all the films with uh, Scott Lang from turning him and also the evolution of those films where, you know, they take a character that's initially really comedic and almost like Judd Apatow ish. Uh, cause yeah. not only cause it's Paul Rudd, but because of the tone say, of the film, but the, and then they make a, this interesting transition of him going into a much darker place and the, the movie, especially with the last trailer, it looks like he's going in a much darker, uh, direction. Uh, yeah. well, he, what, he may die. I don't know. I mean, that's yeah. what the trailer is implying. Um, so, ugh. yeah. What do you think of that kind of arc for a character, especially in terms of a of a cinematic uh, universe where he's in all all sorts of films and everything? No, I mean I I like that you know and the um, I mean, granted, like I'm not sure like some of the stuff that I've heard about where he's supposed to be like at the start of the film doesn't necessarily uh-huh. seem consistent with his character development. Um, but I don't know. I would need to watch the film and see how it's executed. Um. But no, I mean, I like I I like the kind of art they built for for Scott's character. Um, I mean, it's it's basically the art that he has in the comic books, um, mm-hmm. where you know he starts out as um, you know, irresponsible. Uh, <laughs> He's Ant Man. <laughs> yeah, um, and then he has to, you know he has to grow into something more than that because doesn't he he steals the Ant Man suit, doesn't he? Yeah, he steals the suit to do some bank rob like you know yeah. heists to pay for his daughter's like um illness it's very much like uh the sandman you know i was just gonna say and then, he, and then he walks into a particle accelerator <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean he goes around he walks around and he says uh, i want to find my daughter <laughs> so i want to find my daughter and see so almost like a um it's almost like a uh, Rocky. I would, I would have loved to have seen uh same man played by uh played oh Stallone. By, uh, Stallone, that'd be great. I'd love that. <laughs> that'd be interesting. You know, you made an interesting point of um oh uh, the other God. day you messaged yes. me about uh Batman and Robin where you messaged something wow. that no one was thinking about. Uh, crazily enough, no one was thinking that. I don't know how anybody yeah missed. This. Why didn't they cast? In Batman and Robin, the Clooney film, why didn't they cast uh, Schwarzenegger as Bane rather than Mr. Freeze? Um, I break you, crazy. Batman. Ah. <laughs> I will break you. I mean, that automatically, fundamentally changes the film, of course. But, uh, you know, because it would the be great. About, I would love it. It would be great. It would be much better than what it what it was. You know, the movie, he's a joke in that film, you know, yeah. in, in Batman and Robin. He's, he's Mr. Freeze. Uh, having his henchmen sing his Mr. Christmas office results are Batman and Robin. <laughs> oh, like it was, it was crazy. But oh. yeah, that would have been some good casting. Yeah. Uh, Schwarzenegger as Mr. Freeze. I don't know how. Like he's a big muscle man. Like how do you, how do you waste that? Like ah, uh, honestly, like it would have been more appropriate yeah, if like Schwarzenegger had been Bane, and if you really wanted to keep, um. If you really wanted to keep Freeze in the movie, I don't think you should have. Um, like cast cast uh, was it Jason Glover um, as uh, who's as Freeze. Jason I mean, Glover? I, um, I think that's his name. Or no, maybe is it Jonathan Glover? I can da- never Dan- Danny his name. Glover. 
<laughs> no, um, Mel Gibson. He plays fucking. He plays Crank in fucking. Um, in fucking. Uh, in Gremlins Two. Why am I forgetting his name? He's also oh John Shazam, Glover. Right? John Glover. Yes. Oh, that would have been. Um, that would have been great. Although honestly, like I mean, because he's in the movie as um Jason Woodrow, the Floronic Man. Yes. Um, yeah. I would just do the Floronic Man. I love. I love. I love. Uh, I love Jason. Like he's a great villain. Um. And I would have loved to have seen like his interactions with Ivy. Um, wow, man, John Glover is Mister Freeze. What a missed opportunity that would, man. Because John Glover, I mean, he's a uh, he's been in a lot of stuff, dude. He's he was he voiced the Riddler in the animated series. He was in Smallville oh God, as uh, about that. as uh, Lex Luthor's father, and he was great in that. He was yeah. in Shazam. <laughs> um, Shazam. Wow, I that would have been great. Um... I rewatched uh, Scrooge um, for Christmas as well, and I forgot that he's also in that as well. Oh, is he? Yeah, and so he he was like in everything in the fucking eighties, um, and it was appropriate that he was in Shazam because that feels like an eighties movie mm-hmm. um, in a really in a really good way. Um, that's part of why I like Shazam so much. Um, God, yeah, it's so frustrating. We might as well now talk about some comic books we've been reading recently. I'm going to let you start, actually. I'm curious what you've been reading, if anything, as of late. Uh, so I, so not, su- not as of late, um, but I have read stuff recently. Um, the big one that I read was Kingdom Come um, by mm. Mark Waite and Alex Ross. Mm-hmm. Um, that was really good. Um, cause it's, yes. It was basically like my first superman story um since like i mean i guess really forever um because you know i've started getting the superman more within the last year or so yeah um but it's really good it's not um it's not a perfect book um mm-hmm. but it's very very close to being a perfect book um what's yeah, keeping was, it i don't i don't know um there's I don't know there's something about the there's something about the conclusion to the book that's rubs me slightly the wrong way um where and it, it's been a while since I've read it and I've read it like I think maybe twice initially yeah it's been a while since then where like I don't know, like something about it. Um, something about the ending broke me the wrong way because it felt like, like the whole book is about um, the values that defined the traditional superheroes. Um, and it made them better than um, the the new crop of superheroes that sprang up. Um, not necessarily in their absence, because some of them are still around. Um, but um, what made that like what made them better, and what made them? It seems to be going for the angle that like the value that or the values that defined those heroes are kind of timeless. But then the end of the book seems to imply like oh like we need to update ourselves for the times um so it's like yeah i don't know so it, slightly mixed messages i feel like again mm-hmm. i need to go back and reread to confirm um to confirm like that yeah okay that does seem to be what it's saying but that's yeah that's kind of what i remember um it's kind of what i remember being like wait eh, you're you're almost there you're very close um yeah but, i could definitely yeah. see that with that book of uh the idea being that superheroes become a culture 
that is getting way out of hand in terms of property damage and loss of life. And yeah. uh, it's escalated ever since the disappearance of Superman, who's self-exiled and years have passed on to where uh, now there's a whole new generation, like you were saying, of superheroes just popping out of the woodwork and like Batman is running Gotham like a police state and everything. And it, there, there's definitely a high sense of anarchy in that book that yeah. – you almost feel like the the message is um thank god these people don't actually exist in real life <laughs> oh yeah you know um especially with the end uh the climax in there yeah. um i i'm i wonder if like the intention of wade was like okay what i want the reader to feel is we need to, like the in the world of these heroes the resolution should be they need to be outlawed like a hundred percent yeah 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 i don't know it's yeah i don't know so so again like i would need to go back and reread the book again um but yeah it's like if you, it kind of feels like the whole book is like it it leads you in one direction but then within like basically within like the last 10 pages it kind of leads you in a slightly different direction it's like wait 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 wait, wait, wait. i think we were going over here not over there yeah. um so i mean like, yeah but besides that like it's still a really good book um you know yeah obviously everyone talks about um how beautiful um how beautiful alex ross's artwork is it is beautiful i will say um it there are times where I found it to be a little bit tough on the eyes. I think um, Ross's artwork really shines when he has a lot of space to work with. Yeah, um, yeah. A lot and, of the scenes get, get a little cluttered, especially battle scenes and everything where uh, heroes yeah. are all over the place and everything. Yeah, some of the some of the ways that the um, the panels are the panels are laid out and that coupled with because the you know the way that he works i think he works with watercolors um but like the materials that he's using combined with the layout of the page makes and, and especially the more cramped the panel is um in terms of like the scale and the cropping it yeah it starts to get a little bit tough on the eyes especially because um the colors that he's using give they, they give his artwork a kind of um almost like a kind of soft focus mm -hmm. there's a kind of soft focus to some of his pieces that make it a little bit like okay like my eyes are starting to hurt now um but again like other than that very like again and again like people have praised kingdom come to kingdom come yeah. um, and, with, and with good reason um because it is course, a really, yeah. really great book um and actually it's funny too because it um it does <laughs> it it tackles um two it tackles two things that comic book media tried to do recently within like the last 10 years where it tackles the joker killing superman's wife lois mm -hmm. lane and how he reacts to that and it also tackles the superman and wonder woman ship uh, which they tried to do in the new 52 yeah and, and then they, they gave up on it well, they killed off Lois Lane, so it's like, uh, he's a Wonder Woman now. <laughs> Great um, idea. And it's like, and it's like nah, no, <laughs> no. I mean, like, yes, like, I, I'm not someone who thinks, like, no, like, so you should never get together with Wonder Woman. I'm fine with that. It does have to be after Lois has passed away. Mm -hmm. But just killing Lois off and being like, ah, oh, he's with Wonder Woman now. Like, no, just, just stop. No, yeah. It, it should be left at, um, in kingdom come where it actually does work yeah. and there's actually yeah, some it, drama between their uh ideologies which make conflict in the relationship yeah and it and it's a pro again and it's appropriate because lois has passed away and not only that but like she's passed away and like clark is now she he's had an appropriate amount of time to grieve um yeah so it's not like it's not like he's just like treating diana like some kind of rebound or something no um, and she almost like pulls him out of that grieving process yeah. Because he's been doing it for too long at that point. You know what I mean? He's very much uh, a hermit at the beginning of Kingdom Come. 
you know, yeah. and uh, yeah, and then he's obviously like Skywalker almost. <laughs> we're not, he's not that bad, but. Yeah, he's he's away. He's away <laughs> doing his own thing. He's like, man, screw them. I don't care what yeah. any of them have to say. <laughs> do, do Kryptonians do they have blue milk? Do they did they drink I hope blue so. milk from, from alien tits like a homeless slob? I hope not. Yes. <laughs> what Luke of Skywalker course they drinks, do drinks blue milk from an alien's tit like a homeless slob. Um, <laughs> there has to be like I, I'm. There has to be like a blue milk reference somewhere in like DC. That has to be a thing. I. Um, you know what? Um, Superman does have a menagerie of like alien pets, or uh, I guess a zoo is the most comparable yeah. um, reference. You know, so one of them has blue milk for sure. He's probably looked at one of those aliens and then like, I can milk you, <laughs> <laughs> but will it be blue? <laughs> He's like, damn, this one's green. This, ooh, this one's yellow. Ugh, ugh. That may not be milk. I, yeah, if, if he x-rayed inside the animal, the alien animal, I wonder if he could tell the color of the milk. That's got to be pretty, that's got to feel violating, right? Like being like, like having Superman use x-ray vision. Obviously, like, you know, the yeah. joke is like, I think there's like a family guy joke about him. Yeah. Uh, like all of his female co-workers have breast cancer because For... he's been x-raying their boobs. Like that's so like it's not you wouldn't actually be able to see naked titty flesh with the way <laughs> Superman's X-ray vision works. I mean, realistically, but it's still got to feel slightly violating, right? Oh, of course, yeah. I mean, for he, he was like, man, first every woman I've ever known. Now you guys, <laughs> yeah, no, that's <laughs> awful. That like that's literally uh, the boys. You remember that yeah. scene in the the first season of the boys where he's just standing there? That's what. But the the only difference is she knew. Yeah. And she was like into it, yeah, yeah. I, f- I feel like I feel like X <laughs> uh I feel like that's something Jimmy would do. I feel like Jimmy Olsen would. Oh, for his sure. Co-workers, uh, absolutely, absolutely. Naked titty flesh, and he's like, oh no, that's not how this he, power works. That was actually the first draft of uh, Batman versus Superman, but then they, <laughs> you know, it would have been a four-hour oh. film. <laughs> oh, that reminds me. So this this makes way more sense having learned this. Apparently, so apparently. Um, uh, Doomsday was thank Christ. Doomsday was not originally supposed to be in the movie. That was something the executives pushed. Sure, to include. Yeah. Apparently, I guess Scoot McNary's character, the guy in the wheelchair, I guess yes, he was originally supposed to be Metallo, and he yeah fought Superman at the end, which way 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 better, so much better. That would have been better. I, I heard about that from um I think Justin told me that actually, and it makes a lot more sense, uh yeah. because they got such a prominent actor for that nothing of a part, you yeah. know, and um it felt like they were gonna do something like it like you know Luthor comes up to him and everything and and it's like really just for a bomb in a wheelchair they're doing all of this and and then it yeah. turns out that he would be Metallo, and yep. uh, that would have been that would have been good yeah. Yeah, I mean, we fought, we would have got to see Metallo, and we wouldn't have wasted Doomsday. I know, yeah. I, I, but I, then... I, 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 I hate even calling it even calling it Doomsday because it's not really Doomsday. It's it's Zod's corpse, and yeah, it's not Doomsday. It's not well, Doomsday. The, is the uh, I'm curious with the implementation of Metallo of Scoop McNary being Metallo in the film, does Superman still die? Um, I probably he probably did because I think that was um. Well, I don't know, because um, I think that may have been that may still have been Snyder's intention, but I uh-huh. don't know actually. Be, because you know, to Ma- know, Metallo has the kryptonite heart and everything, and yeah, you know, he certainly. I I could see it happening. I think it would be a bit of a stretch, um, if yeah he was to die by the hands of Metallo and. Batman and Superman are there to fight Metallo. I think that's a big stretch, actually. To yeah, you know, <laughs> you know, I I'm curious. That's interesting. Yeah, I don't know. Another one of those things where it's like, why why would they do that? Why would they do that? <laughs> uh, well, for why me, it's actually it's him? another one of those things. It's like another reminder that that era is over of DC. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's over L- let me tell you a book that i read um was yeah. reading um last uh year at the end of tail end of last year um that i knew about 
and I picked up a copy because of the cultural significance, and uh, I heard that there were going to be fewer and fewer copies left uh, out there. I don't know if that's the case anymore, but um, it was Art Spiegelman's Mouse. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I yeah. thought you already had a copy. No, I didn't. I had a... I knew about Mouse for years, you know, because there's uh, there are two. There's Mouse One, there's Mouse Two, and everything. I got yeah. the collection. I saw it over okay. at a, a Amoeba because they have really good uh, deals on books and everything. Right. And um, I saw it and I picked it up. Or no, I didn't even go to Amoeba to pick it up. I went somewhere else. And um, uh, but I heard an article that apparently they were there. There were like colleges or stores or something taking mouse off the shelves yeah and i don't know have you heard about that did you hear anything I, about that i remember hearing a little bit about it um i don't it's been so long ago now that i don't remember yeah it's um, been a while it's maybe been a the year justification was for it it's obviously stupid it is um, really stupid yeah it's i'm surprised because i don't think it's not going out of print is it because it's one of those it's one of those books where they just constantly like reprint it because there's it's such an and such it, high it, they can always make money off of it. Yeah, I don't know if it's out of print. I doubt it because I picked yeah. it. I where I picked this up was at an actual comic book store. So, you okay. know, there's a difference of picking something up there versus say Amoeba, and yeah. um, um. So yeah, I I decided because of that whole, there were colleges taking it away because I guess it's it was deemed inappropriate. I said, yeah. I should probably pick up a copy. And uh, for those who don't know about Mouse, it's a classic in terms of uh, comic books and graphic novels. Um, it is the documentation of... Uh, so Art Spiegelman is a writer who is a character in the book, uh, technically, who interviews his father about his time during the the... German occupation of uh, Poland and uh, the, his time in the concentration camps and everything, and uh, his fa his father's a survivor of that time, and has all these stories about you know the before, during, and after, and uh, it's a really interesting book where the interviews are throughout, and the Jews are depicted as mice, and the Nazis are depicted as cats. You know that's like the big uh, visual. Uh, the the most famous visual is the nazi uh, swastika with the cat yeah, <laughs> adolf the cat hitler head. in the middle <laughs> yeah. um and it is a heartbreaking book it is yeah absolutely I, heartbreaking i remember because you know my the middle school library had a copy of it and they i'm gonna say thank thank you to my my middle school library because they were a big part of what allowed me to get into comics so they had a pretty decent collection i remember mm -hmm. I remember I think flipping through it, um, the middle school's copy and being like, eh, <laughs> this is kind of heavy looking. <laughs> Maybe yeah. I'll, I'll read this another time. And it's great. It's great. Um, have did you ever read it? In no, I I never have. Um again, like it wasn't um when I first came across it, uh it was one of those things where I was like, Yeah, it's this is a little heavy. And plus, you know, again, like I, yeah, no, no, it just wasn't something that I would have read, um, on my own time. Um, mm -hmm. I think, especially because, like, it's one of those, it's one of those rare graphic novels that got integrated into, um, like school curriculum. Yeah. So it was, I also had the reputation of being like, oh, like this is a school thing. <laughs> I don't want to read a school thing. <laughs> if I maybe I'll I'll read it. I'll read it like some point. Like it, I'll read it at some point later in middle school. I'll probably have to. I didn't, as a matter of fact. Um, I probably should. Um, yeah, if you want to borrow it sometime, just uh, I'll let you borrow. It. Just be careful <laughs> because yeah. it's a nice copy. Um, because it's really good. It's thick. Also, it's a thick because it's both books. It's a collection. I just say, well, I mean, even the I remember even just the individual volumes being pretty meaty. So, yeah, it's it's really interesting because uh, you get to I feel like because it's uh, the stories of a single person, you know, um, where the son is interviewing the the his father. So you're getting his perspective of it. This really does personalize World War Two from yeah. a Polish person's a Polish Jew's 
perspective uh from that time you know so you get to see like he it starts off like a slow burn you know what i mean like you get to learn about his life and his town and everything and these women that he was with and women that he was after and his job and everything and you know him as a young man or a young mouse or whatever and (laughs) and uh then the war starts to slowly creep in and you get to hear more about the the this guy hitler you know and you get to hear about these nazis then they're moving and they're they're making their move and everything and and um it really is it's heavy it is heavy you're right (laughs) you know because that's a big part of history that is not um i mean it's messy you know yeah yeah so that's quick yeah no go ahead go ahead on uh because i i I remember this and it's always slightly uh, amusing. So do you know what the etymology of the word Nazi is? No. Well, so obviously um, it's a, well, there's two, there's two etymologies. Um, one is um, obviously Nazi is a contraction of the word national and socialistisch. Um, so you get Nazi out of that. Um, and that contraction is actually borrowed from the, I think it was slightly derogatory. Mm-hmm. Um, the shorthand for the German Social Democrats, Sozi, S O Z I. Um, so it's partially borrowed from that, but I think this was just a coincidence. Um, it is the word Nazi is also a colloquial derogatory word for a backwards farmer or peasant. I'm reading from Wikipedia now, characterizing <laughs> an awkward and clumsy person, a yokel. Um, in this sense, the word Nazi was a hypocorism of the German male Ignaz. It's a variation of the word Ignatius, Ignatz being a common name at the time of Bavaria, the area from which the NSDAP emerged. Dude, I'll let them all do lesson. I, <laughs> I always found it amusing. All I picture is like Go- Gomer Pyle from uh, Andy Griffith's show, as like like thousands of them of Gomer Pyles as Nazis. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's all. I, that's all I picture. Oh man. Um was there anything else? Because I have one other book that I was reading. Uh, but I uh, wanted to ask, was there anything else you wanted to bring up in terms of the, the straight up comic book stuff? Yes. I well, I so I don't remember. Did we did I talk about Doomsday Clock on an earlier podcast? Do you remember? No, we didn't, but here, it's interesting that you bring that up because I was uh, here. Let me go first and then we'll go to what Doomsday Clock because I was yeah. reading. <laughs> I wrote a paper about the art of Dave Gibbons. So you yeah. have to bring up Watchmen. So yeah. I had, I reread Watchmen and uh, it was noticing the art and Alan Moore's, you know, uh, structure and everything. And it was doing a lot of research on their relationship and how they were approaching the project. And uh, it is, it's right there. It's a masterpiece. It's it's Watchmen, <laughs> you know, and um, it's 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 I mean, we were talking about nihilism earlier with Batman. <laughs> I don't think in terms of like the mainstream of DC characters, I don't think you get any more nihilistic than Watchmen. Well, no, I was going to say, uh, I would hesitate to label it mainstream, but or as far as if we're talking about like the main canon universe. But yes, yeah, I mean, there's definitely Ma- mainstream in terms of like, you know, what people know people know sure yeah um yeah i'm trying to think if there's something i don't know um hellblazer might might uh might give Watchmen yeah. a run for its money because john goes to some pretty dark places yeah um, i would say i would probably deviate i mean obviously i think the punk you know flavor and the punk uh punk is very much like uh, maybe even a subsect of nihilism in some ways. Sure, it's very but nihilistic. I f- it is, but or, I feel especially like especially early, early punk, anyways. Yeah, that's true. So you know that is true. That's fair. But I think maybe uh, being punk has more. You have more reason in that as opposed to nihilism, where you're just like you've given up on everything. Your you know hopelessness and all that. I don't know, but that's an interesting point, Hellblazer. Yes, which I I don't remember where I left off on that. I think I got maybe like two or three volumes in. I need to pick it up because they still have, they still have uh, collected Hellblazers if I haven't read through um, that I got like years ago when I was in high school for 
think it was either it was either birthday or Christmas. I think it was Christmas. Um, should I well, should I talk about Doomsday <laughs> Clock now? Sure, but you, just the, as a little side. Uh, last time we hung out in person, you were kind of dressed like that John Constantine, you know. <laughs> yes, I was. Well, I I got. I mean, well, it's funny too because I I got that um, I got that trench coat specifically because I wanted to dress as Rorschach for yeah. Halloween one year. Um, and I've had that coat for like, I think well over a decade now. Um, oh wow! Yeah, it's 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 an old coat, um, but it served me well. I actually had to get it repaired. Um, oh well, then you're you're perfect then for Rorschach if it's all beat yeah. up and everything. Well, I mean, it's not the, it wasn't the outside. Like I've, I've taken pretty good care of it. Um, it was the, I had to get the lining fixed and I had to replace a couple buttons because oh, okay. there were some tears, there were some tears in the lining. Um, I think just from like friction or whatever. Um, so I had to get some panels sewn into that and I had to get a couple buttons replaced because they were falling loose. Um, Dude, I can't wait to see you walking around uh, Pasadena in the Rorschach costume and you're just muttering uh, to yourself about all the that, whores that's and just children. My, that's just my daily life. Um, yeah, I know, right? I like people hear, just like hear all, you saying they hear, they hear me talk about how like the Theosophical Society has like a weird fucking like, they have, oh god, they have this weird thing in the fucking UN headquarters and it's like the location is like supposed to be like lined up with like Earth's magnetic. It's fucking weird. The Theosophists are really weird. Um, not to get into like weird occult shit. I got a bunch <laughs> of books on the occult for Christmas. I have like one about like, oh Freemasonry my. and another oh, about. Oh no. Um, I, I'm reading it now. Like, oh. Is it a graphic novel? No. Or is um, it just I a book? I, I only got um, nonfiction for oh, okay. uh, Christmas, but I got this The Occult Roots of Nazi Alum, which is kind of goes into like the influence of theosophy, which is this weird kind of like. Um, <sighs> kind of gnostic um mystery religion um mm -hmm. that it, it has influence not just in nazism but in just like a variety of like weird elite um political cliques across the world it's really creepy it's really creepy it's really creepy oh i'm sure um, that reminds me of a uh, hellboy a little bit yeah no i mean like yeah. they know like they generally they genuinely i'm sure like some stuff that the theosophists believe ended up in like hellboy and stuff like they believe in sure, like, yeah. Maria and some shit and you know like you know, some of the myths that they believe in like they show up across different cultures and i i'm into like comparative anthropology and comparative theology and stuff like that so it's like uh you know some of these myths like they show up across a whole bunch of different cultures okay like there's maybe something there mm -hmm. um but it's like yeah, it's very, very, very weird, and like it goes into like, weird <laughs> racial theories. It's oh, creepy, no. and it's like, yeah, it's very, it's very creepy. We can get into this sometime off the air. Um, that that's an ignore this podcast for sure. Yeah, no, yeah, <laughs> um, where I I talk about, uh, I don't know if this was like fake or not. Um, that I remember seeing um, some headline, um, whereas like I I think yeah, I'm sure it was probably like fake. Um, but it was like the UN made an announcement where it was like um, uh, UN announces that the world is not run by a shadowy cabal of elites. And it was just a reaction <laughs> image of Bart Simpson underneath where it's like, what an odd thing to say. Um, but yeah, uh, Doomsday Clock. Yes. <laughs> Doomsday Cock. I, I agree. <laughs> this is probably very bony, right? It's probably gone through a lot. Uh, absolutely. Um. It's going right through Alan Moore <laughs> and uh, his his uh, his pride. Yes, uh -huh. poor poor Alan, poor Alan. And anyway, <laughs> so yeah, Doomsday Clock. Um, really, really great. Um, written by uh, Jeff Johns. Jeff Johns. Il illustrated by I think now probably uh, my favorite Gary comic Frank. book artist. Yeah, I say I love I love Gary Frank's work. I think the first thing that I saw him. I think the first time I was exposed to his work was Batman Earth One. Um, oh yeah, that's true. He he also he's been doing a lot of stuff. Uh, yeah. Batman Earth One. He did a the Superman versus Brainiac story. Action he did comics. Shazam, which is yep. also written by Jeff Johns, which was they, the New Fifty Two. Yeah, which they basically adapted for the Shazam movie minus Black Adam. Um, yeah, but yeah. He's I say he's a he's a phenomenal artist. Um, I feel like he's. Um, as far as like just being um kind of like his art style kind of being everywhere i feel like he's almost like the new jim lee 
Um, I think Jim's getting a little lazy yeah. as far as uh, <laughs> as far as doing illustration stuff now. Um, but yeah, I just say yeah, I love his artwork. He's probably my favorite comic book artist at this point. Um, certainly for superhero stuff, and it's yeah, it's that's another it's another one of those. Um, so there, it's basically a Superman story, um, and it's um, the basic premise is that um, it's kind of a it's kind of a continuation of Watchmen, um, but it's also a it's basically a crisis story. Um, yeah, it's one of those which I normally am like, oh no, no, another <laughs> crisis story. Oh God, no, because the the crisis the crisis stories are just they're just excuses for DC to reboot their continuity. Yes, um, but this which, one is meant to explain the reboot, <laughs> all of them. Yeah, well, well, and it um, it actually like um. It actually does stuff like there's there's aspects of doomsday clock that like yes it's obviously justifying like okay this is why the reboot happened and all that but it um it adds like in universe commentary to it that makes mm -hmm. it makes it feel like special within the universe um because the basically uh, you know going back it the premise is basically that um ozymandias um the antagonist of watchman uh his plan has failed um the information before, about the the death of everyone in new york has come yeah, out the vagina squid the vagina yeah. the truth about the vagina squid <laughs> has come out because um, Rorschach's journal got out there, and the yeah, information Rorschach's got out journal there. got leaked. Um, and on top of that, he has cancer, so you know his, you know he he's gonna die, and his world is gonna die. So he's like, and Doctor Manhattan is gone. Um, yeah, because at like, the I end, need... he was like, "I'm out of here. I'm going yeah, to the bye. New world. Um, Screw this." <laughs> yeah, I'm tired of these. Uh, what is it? I'm tired of these. Uh, hang on. These I'm people and the, the, the meddling aspects of their lives, they suck. I don't like them. Um, yeah. I am tired I of Earth. These people, I am tired of being caught in the tangle of their lives. It's just a great quote. Exactly. Um, but he's like, okay, so I like I need to I need to find John. He's the only one that I know of that can fix this. Um, so he outfits um Archie, the owl ship, and turns it into a basically a a, a multiversal uh, like a multiversal vehicle that allows him to hop between different realities um, and he brings along with him um, a new Rorschach um, which I won't I mean the you know the book has been out for forever yeah but... it's been out for a while and it, it was a uh, it was released over the period of a couple years because yes. of the delays yeah, which I won't. But yeah. either way, I don't. I don't want to go into yeah, spoiling of course, Vortex's yeah. character because he's he's genuinely really great, and I didn't expect um, I didn't necessarily expect him to be as Vortex the second to be as great a character um, as he is. But like, yeah, I don't know. Just I know like people have said like, oh, Jeff Johns, like his magical Jeff Johns powers have waned a lot <laughs> in recent years. But like, like goddamn, like Doom's like Clock is still really solid. But mm -hmm. anyways, um. So yeah, he so he brings along a new Rorschach and then Punch or sorry no um the character they're based off of Punch and Julie who are old Charlton Comics um, yeah supervillains um their names are Mime Mime and Marionette Mime and um, Marionette yeah yes um anyways but yeah he shows up in on Earth Zero um and uh, Earth Zero is basically going through a kind of a similar um they're kind of going through events that are similar to watching where like they're they're kind of on like the brink of not a nuclear war necessarily but a metahuman war where yeah um there's the, the superman theory is out in the public where yeah. you know that which is probably one of the more interesting aspects of the book yeah um, i would say i really like that the idea is that like well why and it's you know it's kind of got a meta element to it or it's like yeah. you know why are Obviously, like a lot of the super, the vast majority of the superheroes in the DC universe are American. Um, you know, you have the odd one out, like you know, Rocket Red, 
um, old yeah. Soviet, uh, old so basically Soviet Iron Man. Um, and it's not, not even not... a singular person, which you know yeah. makes sense with the Soviets. You know they don't want to idolize a single guy. So it's just <laughs> some some Russian, some Slav in a in a in a, in a robot suit, basically. It is um, interesting though that no one brings up that uh, you know characters like Aquaman and Wonder Woman are not American, and they not only are superheroes, but they have are in charge of their whole uh, like countries of their own. You know, yeah. But yeah, so it's like you know, the vast majority of superhero, the vast majority yeah. of metahumans are American. Um, so there's this theory, and there's you know some leaked documents that indicate that like there's actually you know metahumans are to a degree a natural occurrence, but that the U.S. government was deliberately um, basically Creating deliberately them. manufacturing metahumans to yeah. turn into superhuman operatives. Um, yeah. And so there's some questions about um, basically Superman is the only one who's left untainted by that because he's not really a metahuman. He's an alien. Um, and yeah, everyone's like, him. we can trust Superman. Superman yeah. is the... Uh, we, we can trust that he's not government made. Yeah. 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 At the very least, that he's not government made. Uh, yes. So, yeah, and there's... Um, yeah, it's just kind of like Earth Zero is kind of on the brink and there's also like... <laughs> questions about like okay like there's some weird like mandela effect shit going on where okay someone is very clearly altering the timeline um yeah that because be dr manhattan of the justice and, society of america yeah. yeah there's documentation and footage i think of them during world war ii yeah. um and uh, people are like what the fuck specifically lex luther is like what who are these people because they didn't exist in the uh canon since uh flashpoint i think it was and the new 52 yes yeah and there's there's actually a really great um a really really great uh subplot following um johnny thunder um mm -hmm. who's um i would say which i just have to say two of the two of the really standout characters in the book are johnny thunder and then um was it uh, uh miss Saturn lewis Byron Lewis, Byron Lewis um, okay. Mothman. Yes, um, that's right. Yeah. And to say Mothman in particular is really well done. Um but um <laughs> yeah, like he basically like Byron Lewis, or sorry, not Byron, um Johnny Thunder, who's a member of the old JSA, um, had like basically a magic genie who yeah. <laughs> would help him on his crime fighting adventures. Um <laughs> he's like you're introduced to him and you think he's like dementia patient, but it's actually that he has memories of the old timeline um and he tries to find he's trying to he's trying desperately to find his genie but he ends up finding um alan scott's old green lantern um and yeah just like some of the some of the character moments with him um were really really great um i yeah, was gonna say that it uh sorry to interrupt but johnny's no, an interesting vessel for that you know what I mean? You'd imagine they do something like Alan Scott as the uh, uh, the character who remembers, or or Jake. Well, Eric Alan's or not. Have... Alan's not even present in um on Earth Zero in the New Fifty Two. Um, so right. You have to choose someone like Johnny. Um, yeah. Because they, yeah, I mean, they they exiled his ass to Earth Two, um, in the New Fifty Two. Um, we're gonna say, and, there, and there's some interesting stuff that they do where um, uh, where they have him. They kind of explicitly bring in um, the connection that he, it's implied that he had in the golden age to like plants where he's made like basically an avatar of the green, which mm -hmm. is the same, um, the same force that the swamp thing uh, is an avatar of basically, uh, or a servant of. Um, and they have like Solomon Grundy as his, uh, his arch nemesis, which he had back in the golden age. Um, he's like an old, he's like an avatar of the gray, which I think is supposed to be death right it's like yeah just it's almost like the decay it's almost like the black lanterns um, yeah mainstream country which i like nightcrawl aside <laughs> i hate the deep lore that jeff johns has made for green lantern <laughs> we'll get into this more when we talk about our oh i'm excited movie for picks. That. I, yeah. I hate i hate some of the lore decisions i hate some of the innovations that he made to green lantern Ugh. i hate i hate that every single i hate that every every light in the emotional spectrum now has a fucking core associated with it i hate that it i can you, so you're dumb. a red lantern you are a red lantern 
Uh, you know, you're probably not wrong because Guy Gardner, <laughs> I think, is now my favorite Green Lantern. Oh, is um, he a Red Lantern now? Uh, well, no, he, he or he was at a, a, at a point. He has been a Red Lantern at different okay. points. Okay. Um, you know, I could see really that. Great. I love that. Yeah, I could. Say, I make, could see him as sense. either either that or a uh, the orange uh, Avarice uh, Lantern. You know. Even really? though it's uh, it's just one guy, what's funny about that is that it's one guy in the Orange Lantern uh, yeah. core. <laughs> but that's yeah. I, I could for some reason they made um Lex Luthor the Orange Lantern during uh, Black Snake. I say um, that that's that's that oh. makes sense. Um, it really it adds a lot as far as um, it adds a lot of meaning within like the DC comic book universe. It adds a lot of meaning to. Um, to the continual reboots it gives like a kind of in-universe reason that's just mm-hmm. part of like the natural process of the natural cycle of life for universes within the dc like multiverse or omniverse or whatever it's called um but it the also metaverse i think they called no, it the it was, metaverse uh I, omniverse i think there is technically such a thing as a metaverse um mm-hmm. but i think the metaverse in maybe include it's something else stuff like the marvel universe and wildstorm i'm not sure well they they do make a reference to uh a potential crossover between marvel yeah. and dc so i think yeah. that's why it would be a metaverse yeah um but um yeah but it, it does yeah it adds a lot <laughs> the of secret crisis context. say again <laughs> the secret crisis of 2030 oh. Oh, god <laughs> They'll probably do something like that eventually. They'll probably I, do something like that. I'm not. I'm not actually against it. <laughs> no, I'm not either. Actually, um, but um, yeah. I mean, uh, yeah. It adds a lot of. It adds a lot of context to those kinds of. It adds like an in-universe reasoning to those changes, and it does so in a way that um, makes Superman feel really special within the DC universe. Um, yeah, like, I. I like that as well. I like the um, because we were talking earlier about the whole how Batman is essentially an institution and Batman is the basis for DC. I mean, DC came from Detective Comics initially, yeah. you know, um, but I really like that. Something I do like about Doomsday Clock that uh, they made Superman so integral to the universe. I mean, you see what happens in terms yeah. of the butterfly effect. You know, one of my favorite moments is uh, where John... Uh, uh, not John Stewart. Uh, what's his? Uh, Doctor Manhattan. Oh, Doctor Manhattan. Uh, Doctor yeah. Manhattan. John Osterman. John Osterman. That's his real name. Um, where he witnesses the initial, uh, the initial appearance of Superman back in thirty nine, I think it was. And yes. uh, you know, it's the iconic cover of him holding the car and everything. And he looks back to Dr. Manhattan and he smiles at him. He smiles at a naked blue irradiating man. And he's like, yeah, awesome. Awesome. <laughs> but yeah. by the way, they also, they reference that in, um, in a uh, Superman and Lois. Um, and he has, oh, do they? Superman has, yeah. Superman has this wonderful line. Um, this kid compliments him on his, uh, on oh, his on costume. his outfit. It, and yeah. he's like, thanks, my mom made it for me. My mom made it. <laughs> and it's like the it's the most wholesome Superman line I think I've ever heard. I know. Tyler is 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 the Superman of the of the modern day. He is the Superman. I'm sorry. Uh, but we'll get into that. Yes. Uh don't worry. Uh but yeah, Doomsday Clock is an interesting successor. Um uh, obviously, you know, tar- a tie-in with the main universe and everything. Um, but enjoyable. Yeah, really, really, really good. And I think much better than a um than a Watchmen follow-up, I think, has any kind of right to be. Um, well, especially one like this, you know, yeah. one that feels very... Just the premise feels kind of cynical in nature. Oh, yeah, it feels very, like, <laughs> cash-grabby, like, hey, look at the, like, some of our two, like, yeah. biggest properties, let's try and, like, meld them together. Yeah, like, it, it let's, feels like something that should not work. Literally. It feel very commercial. Let's um, piss on everything Alan Moore has ever said or thought regarding us as a company. And yes. but but the thing is, in doing that, they tried. John's and Frank still tried with the book, you know, and it's interesting that because you know, when it comes to Watchmen sequels, the writers do try, you know, to make something 
good, whether it be Doomsday Clock or um, the HBO series or the. I've heard very good things about Tom King's Rorschach. Um, I've heard I, very I good read a little bit about it. It sounds so messy and kind of dumb. Yeah. I, sh- I should read it. I don't know. I'm. I think I'm. I, I want to read prejudiced. it. I think I'm prejudiced against Tom King after seeing what he did to Batman. But I don't yeah, know. well, I don't know. I know that, that doesn't mean. Yeah, that, that doesn't mean a very good writer, bad. but yeah. Yeah, that he's he ha- he's someone with I think interesting ideas at least, and he tries yeah. to implement them into his work. So yeah, it's interesting how you know Alan Moore, for years I don't know if he's still on this, but um had like that dogmatic sensibilities regarding his work on Watchmen because he got fucked over by DC, yeah. um, but the people who make the stuff, based in his, on his work, are genuine fans. Yeah, most of the time. Most of the time. Yeah. So, you know, hey, what the hell? Are you, what are you gonna do? What are you gonna do? <laughs> but but the better question actually is, what will James Gunn do yes. for the DCU? Uh, I'm very interested to hear what. So before we even get into this, um, James Gunn will be announcing a slate, hopefully within this month, of the new DC lineup of films. Um, and when we say that, we mean the new universe, as it were, the DCU, a new interconnected uh, web of films, TV shows, video games, animation, um, and comics also. Yeah. Um, so what we are going to do, actually, is we are going to uh, – this is kind of a pitch, you know, because we're not James Gunn. We don't know what he's really going to do. This is what I think you and I would both like to see. So yeah. – why don't you go first and then I'll go uh, second and we'll go for the first phase of the DCU. So wh- yeah. what what do you got? So I had some stuff written down. Um, I'm trying to find it right now. Um, I mean, you know, just off the top of my head, I mean, I think it makes, and I'm sure this is what he's going to do. You know, I think it makes the most sense to do a, Superman movie first to start with that mm-hmm. um, and for ease of reference I'm going to call because I'm going to do you know there are going to be other superhero movies obviously of course. Um, I'm just going to call them like Superman volume 1, 2, 3 etc for ease of reference um, and Gunn has done that in the with this film yeah, well, title I was gonna say with, <laughs> yeah with Guardians of the Galaxy so it's like eh, yeah. it can happen <laughs> yeah um, but uh, yeah I mean I think Start and I'm also I'm when in writing these in my mind like I also am trying to remember like okay Warner Brothers is basically broke at this point so you need to do <laughs> no I mean really like it's true they're kind of broke um, it's so sad I have to <laughs> you basically have to try and approach these characters in a way where you are going to and I think this is I think especially like post end game I think this is also just a smart business move as well even if you weren't broke um you scale back on the spectacle and you focus Mm -hmm. more on the story and the characters and absolutely the kind of heart of the the protagonists of your stories um i think that's i think that's going to be the most um I think that's going to be what is ultimately going to make these new movies a big draw. Um, so in my mind, I'm thinking like, okay, these need yeah. to be kind of smaller in scale. And um, do you think that, and before you go on, do you think that's likely, like how likely do you think that is now that Gunn is the one spearheading this uh, new this new DCU? I do think it is probably likely at least to start out. Um, mm-hmm. You know, there's some of the stuff that he's been, some of the hints that he's been dropping as far as like what he has in mind for specifically the Superman movie it makes me think, okay, this is maybe going to be a little, um, at the very least, it's going to be more story driven, which I'm happy about. Yes. Or more, or more character driven rather. Um, and, you know, again, like just thinking about budgetary constraints, like D- I, DC and Warner Brothers can't afford to do a lot of spectacle at this point. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, but yeah, my idea, so you start with, I think, a Superman movie. In mm-hmm. my mind, I think, again, thinking about, okay, you can't afford a lot of spectacle. Um, do it 
have it be set just in Metropolis um, and focus more in on um, Clark's human side and specifically focus in on him as a reporter. Because it's not something that we, I think it's not something we've seen a whole lot um, of, at least in the movies, is actually him, his reporter side. Um, and actually have yeah. to do like invest some investigative reporting where and have the villain of the film be um, a Mannheim. result of that investigation, right? Yeah. Have yeah. the villain of the film be Bruno Mannheim and Intergang um, and have Clark be investigating Intergang as a reporter and then also have Oof, you know, that's nice. him as Superman working to bring down Intergang. And if you want to bring in like other, I think I think it's a good idea to have Lex Luthor in there um you can in my mind i'm thinking you could use him a couple ways either as an initial ally of superman um because that is um that is how he's initially portrayed in some incarnations of the character um or you can have him be um maybe he's pretending to be an ally um but he's actually you know somehow working with intergang you know like kind of how he is in um superman the animated series Mm -hmm. um but yeah have it have it be basically Superman fighting against kind of normal everyday criminals. Yeah. Um, but they got their like the more... things of like, you know, their super villainish type deal, right? Yeah. Well, I was gonna say because obviously Intergrain is supplied by um um supplied by Dark Side, um, mm-hmm. which I have some very interesting ideas about um because a big oh. part of the reason why Intergang is established is so that um if I remember correctly, it's so that um Dark Side can try and find the anti-life equation on earth and i have some interesting ideas about how you can tie in criticisms of data mining uh to some of what intergangs criminal activities are um basically data mining uh, human beings to try and find the anti-life equation or find elements of it um but yeah to have, if you really want to have you know big superhero or big super villains in it um for the ultra humanite in. no one mm-hmm. uses the ultra humanite um, <laughs> oh, the, is that the the, uh, uh, the uh, ape, the man, the man who who transported his mind into the body of a woman and then into the body of a silverback gorilla? Yeah, of an yeah. albino silverback gorilla. Oh, that would be awesome, dude! I yeah. love that character. He was a ama- he was awesome. He was awesome in a, a Unlimited Justice League Unlimited. He got they mm-hmm. got the perfect voice actor for him. <laughs> yeah, and he's and he's basically the original Lex Luthor too. Yeah. Um, so yeah, put put Ultra Humanite in. Um, and I'm sure there are other like there are other characters who are kind of uh, uh, affiliated with um, your gang. You could probably put in like you know John Corbin, um, Metallo's. Uh, that's Metallo's real name. You could probably put him in as like a yeah. a kind of a, a thug, similar to how um, KG Beast shows up in like Batman vs Superman. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's my idea for a Superman movie. I think, um, and then again, like these are kind of um, I have similar ideas for the other stuff. Like you know. Um, I think, and these are in no particular order, um, like with the Flash, um, because it's the other thing too, is I know that I'm hearing that people are tired of origin stories. Um, I get that. I think it's probably a safe bet is maybe to do, to take basically the 89 or the the approach that Batman 89 or the Batman take um, as far as like um, where their superhero is at in their career. Um, Yeah, like a year in. Yeah, something like that. Um, with um, with the Flash again, like just kind of I think similar idea. Where and that's the other thing too is I'm thinking also of like using like updated versions of the Silver Age, um, updated like versions of certain Silver Age stories for mm-hmm. basics for the characters and plots. Um, in addition to like more Bronze Age or modern stuff. Um, but with like the Flash, also I think you could um. You could just have it be like a kind of fun, um, a fun thing where he's battling against a bunch of different rogues. Um, where you bring in, don't just don't don't even bother about the reverse flash. Don't bother <laughs> about the reverse flash now. Save him for later. Have it. Just, it is it Ezra Miller? We <laughs> <laughs> oh, can talk about that later um, <laughs> off stream. Um, but yeah, like have like have in bring in like, um, I mean, at the very least, bring in Captain Cold. Because he's fine. Oh yeah, um, Captain. Oh, well, yeah, Captain Cold for sure. I've been waiting for. I was about to say Boomerang, but we saw we've seen quite a bit actually. Of Captain Boomerang. I didn't say we've seen a bit of Boomerang, but I'm thinking like, um, 
uh, Captain Cold would be fun. Mirror Master would be fun. Mm -hmm. Um, What is it? Um, The Top would be fun. Trickster would be fun. Um, I'm trying to think of some of the other. Who are the other like kind of main? Um, rogues? the main. Well, uh, what's uh, is another ape? Sh- Gorilla Grodd. Oh, Gorilla, Gorilla Grodd. Grodd. Not Gorilla yeah. Grodd. Save that for later. Mm-hmm. Um, but basically, have just have um, like just have uh, have it be a kind of team up movie between the rogues trying to take down Barry. Um, again, just that sounds perfect. Keep keep the stakes low. For mm-hmm. God's sakes, just keep the stakes low. Just don't don't bother. That that Everything almost plays... sounds like uh, Spider Man Homecoming in terms of scope and mm-hmm. uh, uh, opposing threat, which yeah. is why I like that film a lot. Yeah, yeah. So I think Cold for sure, um, Trickster, Top, maybe even like Pi- stuff like Pied Piper, maybe Weather Wizard. You know, definitely Mirror Master. Um, I'm just looking at other um other stuff. Maybe I don't know, Golden Glider you maybe want to save. Um uh the Pied Piper. Kind of big, uh I think did I say Pied Piper? Uh, I don't, potentially I don't Pied think Piper so. too. Um but basically like he's a fun <laughs> every everyone who's not Grod, reverse flash, or um uh God or speed. basically. Um <laughs> yeah, basically everyone everyone besides that. Just have it be like a fun team of movie. Um and then yeah. as far as um as far as and this and we can maybe talk about my issues with Jeff Johns' addition to Green Lantern lore um with Green Lantern <laughs> stuff. Um just have it be a buddy cop movie. Um have it and have it be a buddy cop movie between Hal and Sinestro. Um, because I really, really want to see those two um almost in like a kind of I guess a training day scenario. Mm-hmm. Um we can potentially use that as a kind of basis where Maybe you even, I don't know that I would necessarily have Sinestro <laughs> fall at the very end. I think that's uh-huh. what you do in like the second movie. Um, but have, um, like, basically use that as an opportunity to one, show Sinestro as a Green Lantern and show him building his relationship with Hal. Yeah. Because um, because one of the things that, um, one of the things that initially defines their relationship as lanterns. Um, is that Sinestro was very close friends with Abinster, um, Hal's predecessor. Yeah. Um, and he he really does not like Hal. He doesn't feel that Hal was worthy of carrying Abin's ring. And um, he looks down on uh, humans ring. as well. Yeah. You know, he just yeah, has a yeah, prejudice he, towards humans. Yeah, no. Um, yeah, doesn't like Hal, doesn't like humans, doesn't think he's worthy of being a, lan- a lantern, let alone, you know, being Abin's successor. Um and have it be about have the movie be a kind of buddy again like fairly low stakes you can maybe honestly you can maybe um i mean depending on the timeline this is maybe that kind of that adventure is maybe a little too far back in hal's career but there's that first volume of john's is run on green lantern where those first several issues are basically um hal and sinestro teaming up to try and capture Atrocitus, who is murdered. He's was being brought to Oa by um oh no, he wasn't being brought to Oa. Um, um Abin was trying to investigate Atrocitus as a prophet prophecy about the destruction of the Lantern Core. Um but Atrocitus ends up murdering him and escaping on Earth, where he's trying to find where he ends up trying to find um William Hand, um, who's the the man behind the the Blackest Night prophecy. Mm-hmm. Um, who ends up being um, the, the black, black Lantern. Yeah, the Black Lantern. Yes. Yeah, Black Hand. Um, potentially you can have that be kind of the plot where it's them trying to track down Atrocitus. You don't have to have it be that way. It could just be another, some other like pick a random like Silver Age um, Green Lantern villain um, and just have it, yeah, just have it be a buddy cop movie between them mm-hmm. where um, by the end um, Sinestro learns to respect Hal, um, and Hal kind of earns his medal as a lantern. Um, and then, as far as I, I don't know what to do with Wonder Woman exactly. Um, the problem is that um, again, if we're taking an eighty nine approach, you have to have her. You probably have to have her 
um, probably have to move the have to have the movie be set during a Cold War potentially. Mm-hmm. Um, you can maybe do like a New Fifty Two thing where, and I, I I don't like what the New Fifty Two does, where like the reason why Diana arrives in Man's World is because like Man's World is you know closer to the brink of war than it's ever been before, it's something like that. Um, I I like the idea honestly. Then I like what the DCU does, where it's not World War Two that brings Diana into Man's World, but World War One. I. I feel like that makes more sense as far as like a conflict of that scale like it should she should have mm-hmm. come in to the world earlier than world war ii yeah for sure world war one makes sense yeah um but with that um honestly what could be fun is um because there, there are a lot of like um there are a lot there are a lot of um kind of movies about like the cold war and preventing like nuclear annihilation i'm thinking in my mind of like um war games with i think it's um uh, matthew broderick right yeah i was gonna say matthew yeah. broderick i couldn't remember if it was matthew broderick or um michael j fox um but something like that where um and in my mind i'm thinking you can probably have um maybe like phobos and demonos who were aries the sons of aries mm-hmm. um Although I can't remember actually if um is Phobos and Demonos are those the Greek names or are those the Latin names? Um, I don't know. I think they might be. They sound more Greek than anything. I say I think they're Greek. Um, yeah. I just can't remember because they're that's also the names of um those are the names of Mars's two moons and I can't remember because Mars is Latin obviously. So it's like oh are those Greek or Latin? I don't remember. But have it be like them. Uh, have them be the villains and have them be um honestly the idea the, the other idea i had is um you could even have it not you'd not be um because in my mind i was thinking like oh you know you have like oh Bobos and humanos are trying to start some kind of start some kind of war um that could like empower their father um mm-hmm. you know aries the god of war but in like uh with the Cold War and nuclear weapons, like they actually would probably be opposed to nuclear weapons because they realize, like, oh, like a full scale nuclear war would actually be really bad because that could potentially wipe everyone out. And then, yeah, there's if no Ares war. Draw, if that. Ares draws his power from, you know, human conflict, human war, there are no humans to fight. Well, he's kind of shit out of luck. Mm-hmm. Um, so it would actually be kind of interesting if, and they've kind of done this with Ares himself, where they've shifted him since the new two into a more kind of heroic role um you could actually have i think it'd be kind of interesting if you had um bobos and demonos maybe or even aries um team up with diana to stop some kind of nuclear conflict there are a bunch you know there are a bunch of movies you can draw for inspiration for that Um, and just have like just have the villains be like normal dickish humans um in the american and Soviet governments aries Um, literally just needs to live on apocalypse you know and he'll I'm be sure completely he fine. He will be well, apoc- like full apocalypse or war world. Uh, he will live on apocalypse first, and then he will commute every once in a while to war world. I'm sure he would be very good friends with Mongol. He'd probably <laughs> yeah. be very good friends with him. Oh, that sounds great. Yeah, him and Mongol just like hanging out and being like, "Man, you're awesome." Yeah, you're kind of awesome too. <laughs> <laughs> that yeah, would that's be great. my idea for that's my idea for Wonder Woman. Um. As far as um, I also have an idea. It's the thing. The problem. So the problem with Martian Manhunter is that there's. I think as a character, he works best within um, within an ensemble setup for the Justice League. Mm-hmm. Um, there obviously are story like solo stories that you can draw on for him. Um, and I'm wondering honestly if he's maybe better suited like the story in my mind because in my mind like you know the reason why he's called martian manager is because back on mars he's basically a cop yeah um and i'm in my mind i'm envisioning almost a kind of um a cross between a just have it again have it be a fairly low stakes story where it's you know he's been transported to earth um you can maybe draw on robocop 
a little bit where like he's kind of getting his bearings now is as he tries to integrate into society and he's like well the only thing i know how to do is you know Hunt law enforcement men. basically so i'm gonna go and this is what he does in the comics he becomes a private detective yeah um, so just have him be you know have him be investigating some case and have it turn out to be you know give it some kind of connection to uh to mars or like how he came to earth um that's kind of that's kind of my basic idea again like it's it's one of those things where like i don't know i'm not familiar enough with mm mm's character to fully flesh this out in my mind as like a film of um, course yeah but that's basic idea that i have for that um and then um i don't know if you want to do another aquaman movie um it's one of those especially given uh that people are now a little more familiar with aquaman as a character you could probably just introduce him in the justice league movie um which i want i want the justice league movie to be them versus star the conqueror that was the first appearance oh, okay. of the Justice League. That's I cool. want I want something with Starro as the villain. That's like my basic desire. Um and you can even have it again like connected to like maybe Starro got to Mars, but then was stopped. Um and now is like awake awakened. Like maybe there's a Mars mission and Superman is helping out with that. Mm -hmm. Um maybe Star Labs was able to get like a a manned uh, Mars uh a man probe on Mars and Superman is helping out with that and he wakes up Star or something like that. Yeah. Um that's my basic idea. Um and then and I think this is the other thing too is I think it's smart to not give Batman a solo movie until after Justice League. Um you can litter you can have references to him kind of throughout the previous movies. Um but it's always kind of mysterious. Um and you can have you can even have a disparaging remark about you know now he's got now he's toting a kid around. Um, <laughs> shame, shame, Bruce. He's a bad literally parent. Superman a horrible like, parent. You're just gonna see like the tabloids in Metropolis of like you see the shit happening in Gotham. It's like a bad photo. He's of, wearing like... he's wearing hot pants for God's sakes. <laughs> the kid's in swimwear. And he's in bullet fire. They're all that that man in a bat costume is fucking that child. Oh um, man, you had to go there. Yeah, there I can already look, see. They Chris went Hansen there in jokes. real life, okay? They went there in real life. There were HUAC <laughs> meetings about that. No, Frank Miller went there. That's not the same as they went there. That's Frank Miller. Uh, Sick I, bastard. We, we don't talk about that aspect of Carrie and, and <laughs> Carrie and Bruce's relationship. I choose to believe that. Oh, I that... that's not who I was talking about. Uh, that's oh, not who what are you I talking was talking about. I was talking about All Star Batman and Rob. He doesn't. He doesn't fuck dick in that he just physically abuses this him shit right here and neglects him all star batman and robin for right here i don't care what anyone says jesus i still, I still envy the the fact that you picked that up and i didn't i should have <laughs> picked that up right i should have picked that up <laughs> i know <sighs> it is ironic like like uh like your homeboy palpy said ironic yeah but anyways my <laughs> and my idea for the um the Batman movie is that um it's know, after about, Justice League. Yeah, and I have there's one of two things you can do. I think um depending on how much mileage you want to try and get out of the actor you've chosen to play Batman. Um you can do either um you can basically do either an adaptation of the storyline where Tim Drake, because I'm thinking this is after well, I don't know. Potentially, after Jason has died, um, you can either do maybe an adaptation of the storyline where Tim Drake becomes Robin, uh -huh. um, or you can do some combination of Hush and um, Under the Red Hood. Although, again, it's maybe a little bit early for that. Um, but in yeah, my mind, for be. these bad in my mind for these Batman movies, I really just want to be bruce down i just want to <laughs> throw all the shit at him that i can and i want to see um i want to see how quickly he stands back up um i just want to be unforgiving to him just throw every obstacle at him like he's gonna have to take on bane and then jason mm -hmm. and then hush in like quick succession is uh is that, is is that the, kind of thing is the batman film the last in so uh, ideally justice league 
is where Batman is physically introduced. And then yeah. Batman is Batman the last film of that phase of the first phase? Potentially, yeah. Um mm-hmm. I'm thinking, yeah, that's my idea. And you can potentially um one of the other ideas they had is like you maybe you should do like another Superman movie in between there. Uh-huh. Um and you can have you don't have Batman show up, but you can have Bruce Wayne show up. Mm, you can kind okay. of like obliquely reference like, eh, okay, there's something about this guy. Clark thinks he's not I mean, you maybe even have him like kind of discreetly help Clark out with whatever is going on. He's like, but not as Batman. Take this, yeah, not as Batman. He just like right. he passes him a thumb drive or something with some mm-hmm. information that's helpful. for for a case or or a, not a case a story, right? Yeah, yeah. Some corporate or even espionage a case. going could on. Be some, it could be something to do with the villains. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, don't have does, him show up as Batman. If you're going to have him, just have him be as Bruce Wayne. Does Bippo um, show up? <laughs> please tell me bippo shows up <laughs> you know what it's james gunn i'm sure bippo and fucking um michael rooker plays bippo fucking uh crypto will show up which i crypto you got to do crypto one of, dude one of those states you know i i'm i'm warming to the silver age but crypto is one of those stupid silver age things that i cannot oh abide why are there dogs brother like, i can i can accept i can accept the fact that like the kryptonians <laughs> look basically identical to humans why are there dogs on crypto why because are they answer me that because I could accept, he's awesome i could ex- i could accept if it's maybe like a shot off or something like that that like shape shifts to look like Dude. a dog but not an actual dog it's got to listen you are just here, here's the thing you are just confirming my suspicion that we will get crypto the super dog in a movie at some point will. in this universe i hope we do we probably will. I mean, we I, we already technically got him in um, Super Pets. Um, I, yeah, I know, but yeah. I need like I need like a a straight up live action crypto. And sure. James Gunn brought us Cosmo, the uh <laughs> the Russian astro dog. So you know, we'll crypto is actually crypto is one of the most is one of the sweetest like companions in Super. I know. Lore. I know. If he's doing that though, I also want him. Uh, I want him to give Damien his bat cow. Oh yeah, dude, that's gonna happen for sure. I I I, I have a cow. Yeah. yeah, you have to. You have to. Um, you you have to please the vegan portion of the uh, audience. You yes. know, preserve the cows, starting with bat cow. <laughs> you know, <laughs> get the flash of turtle. Yes. <laughs> yeah. it'd, be cute. it'd be cute that would be good um anyways, but yeah that's that's my that's your phase idea. yeah that's my slate i'm interested to hear what yours are all right so when it came to uh coming up with a phase of uh dc stuff right this this was actually a bit more difficult to think of um because you have to come up uh with all sorts of perspectives uh, at least the way I approached it, where you have to think about it from the, the side of a producer, the side of a uh, uh, writer, the side of a comic book fan, the side of the general audience and everything. I was actually, funny enough, I don't know how much this influenced this slate of stuff I have, but I was listening all day pretty much um, to uh, the DC uh, EU's reviews by red letter media starting from man mm-hmm. of steel to just now finishing up with shazam yes. uh so there's still plenty to listen to but um hearing that kind of catalog in chronological order of, upon release you know hearing what uh, were because they're not all 100 percent comic book fans they are just pretty much guys at rlm um, yeah i would say rich is really the one who's in comic books yeah, but even he has that kind of uh, that separation, you know. So they're pretty much just three schlubs. So to hear from three schlubs what works and what doesn't, you know, it was a was a big help because, you know, this is essentially a a a, a, a reboot. You know, this is the reboot of reboots yeah. for DC. You know, this might as well be a crisis, and um, so I say that again. <laughs> uh so i don't know actually if you're familiar with some of the older podcasts i did on the original channel where i liked to pitch stuff 
Yeah. And and really get into the nitty gritty and everything and get into the plots and, and the characters and everything. I didn't do that here, but the phase I have is it's written down and it's very narrative, you know, okay. in terms of what's picked and chosen and placed where um, I had, you know, there are premises and stuff, but it's not like straight up plots like how how, you know, I like to do. You know what I mean? Um, sure. I had to had to resist from that uh, because, you know, they, we obviously don't have all year to do this <laughs> and um yeah and another perspective i brought up uh, that i was coming from was someone who's tired of the marvel stuff now yeah i i'm not necessarily tired of the marvel stuff you know we talked a lot about you know all sorts of stuff I, i'm excited for ant-man and what's gonna come but there's a lot of marvel and dc has to do something that will differentiate themselves from that and i completely agree with your approach in that they need to be smaller in terms of stories and you have to kind of gradually build up to the big spectacle that is something like the justice league which is something dc was not really doing um for so long um before and i'm I'm, i promise you i'm gonna get into it but one last thing i want to say is that it's kind of a blessing in disguise that dc is starting at this like restarting everything at this point whereas their competition with marvel is like their phases in you know and they're getting into the multiverse stuff and everything that they're making in terms of the main story is dependent on films from like 20 years ago you know what i mean so it's kind of the perfect time for them to start over and make it as simple as easy to follow as it can get you know yeah okay so enough of my rambling let's get into the uh the quick pitches uh so the first film of this phase of course is superman uh because you know i think james gunn himself has said that he's writing the superman film and everything and you know uh you know it it is the yeah no go ahead i I think he may be done with the first draft i'm not sure if he said for sure but i vaguely remember him saying something like that so well that that's quick work for a first draft you know you know that's impressive um, obviously obviously there are going to be revisions um yeah. but for first draft I, I hope it's i hope it's a good quick first draft you know um yeah and so this is pretty much what Gunn said, which is the young Clark Kent is a reporter in Metropolis. Um, I added a little bit of flavor to it where uh, he's looking into lower level crimes said, and seeing all these figures such as the toy man and live wire and the parasite and all that. And he, unra- he unravels the conspiracy and we see by the end because he's going through the trials and tribulations of of the villains and everything and and he, you know we get to see jimmy olsen and perry white and lois lane eventually um actually i'm i might save lois for a later film actually uh really? i would love to i would yeah because i would like to develop the friendship between clark and jimmy because yeah, that doesn't... was com- that was completely like shat on in bvs like at the beginning i was shocked yeah. when they brought in jimmy olsen and they just like well it's not even jimmy it? olsen it's some cia operative who they i thought i thought it uses was jimmy olsen as a cover i and know they have He's technically a jimmy awful. olsen the jenny olsen the like <laughs> i think she's an indian lady or something who plays her yeah um, but they do nothing with gender her. swap jimmy olsen not jimmy yeah. olsen give me give me like an, an 18 year old or like 21 year old uh carrot top temp yeah I, that is jimmy olsen right there with a bow tie he needs like the libertarian <laughs> bow tie you know it would be great if they i mean the bow ties are come on awesome but um jimmy oh no i'm, I'm not i'm not shitting on bow ties i love no bow no ties. no i agree i agree with you um you should cosplay as jimmy olsen actually i could pull it off i you totally could, could. <laughs> um but so when it comes to this i think it would be cool if if they did kind of strengthen that relationship between him and jimmy like jimmy's kind of his his friend who who like who who he can know he can find out later in the third act or something maybe jimmy's like uh taken by these villains or something and lois could come in uh this is obviously spitball but lois could come in later because traditionally lois is there before clark in metropolis yeah. um but it would be interesting if she was a reporter from another city say let's say gotham and that's why she's a cynical 
and can't believe in something as idealistic as Superman. You know, she obviously that like he's she thinks he's like Homelander or something. <laughs> yeah, you know, like because that's the whole idea of their relationship is that's why it's it's there's an interesting contrast there, even in the Christopher Reeve era, where you know she's the ultimate cynic. And for her yeah. to believe in Superman is like believing in fairy tales, you know, and like like the un the unexplainable, the unimaginable, you know. So that that Gotham thing is a very uh, early, you know, it's a pitch. It, you know, come on, we're pitching. Um, yeah, I think I think at the very least, not having not pairing Clark and Lois up is a good idea, and having especially because you know Clark and Jimmy would be starting out at the planet at similar times. They. Mm -hmm. be kind of similar places in their career so i can see them gravitating towards each other yeah absolutely and, and i i really want that friendship to be i want it to feel some like something rich and you know sweet and like like i'm your friend and i'm gonna be there for you you know what i mean and i think gun does that very well you know i think yeah. he he brings a lot of authenticity in relationships and um like this is just his best friend you know this is superman's best friend um yeah. and uh, obviously uh, as the conspiracy of metropolis uh unravels we realize it is lex luther but yeah. lex luther is not the main antagonist of the first film we save him for later stories because uh they gotta just they gotta build him up like they gotta make when lex you just get get away from lex for a little bit we like yeah, for lex a little bit zod. lex and zod have just been kind of used to death in the movies I agree. And for me, Lex Luthor is one of my favorite villains of all time. Oh, yeah. I I love Lex Luthor as a villain. I think he's a perfect antithesis to what Superman just is, which is why they need to make him like almost like not because I want to see Brian Cranston play him, but he has to be kind of like the Heisenberg, you know? Yeah. D did you watch Breaking Bad? Yeah, of course I have. So, you know, like the, that great feeling of like when, when Hank started to learn more that Walter was Heisenberg, you know, like, like the, it's almost a race, you know? Yeah. I want, I want that feeling for these stories uh, when it comes to Superman and Lex Luthor, you know, mm. I think that could be cool. That would be and, really uh, fun, especially, especially if you have, um, if you have Lex pose as, um, as Superman's friend initially. Yes, that would be interesting. Like, uh, very much like, uh, even though he didn't pose, but in Smallville, they started off as friends and then yeah, I was say, broke and, apart. And a lot, a lot of times, like, and I don't necessarily like this version of the character, but yeah, like, he also grew up in Smallville and yeah, and they actually start out as friends. So, yeah. Yeah. And uh, yeah, the, bring Michael Rosenbaum back. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, he might actually bring him as something. Uh, James Gunn might bring Rosenbaum in as something. We'll see. We'll see. We'll see. As a, as, as a old as Jimmy Olsen, <laughs> can't get over it. <laughs> um, and by the way, I I did something a bit. Um, I took a little bit of a, a, a shit. I don't know. I I said this movie comes out twenty twenty six, just uh -huh. for a, a nice timeline. Yeah. Okay. So after Superman, is uh, the Wonder Woman film. Okay. I'm going to it's this the first one is called The Superman. This is called The Wonder Woman. <laughs> I was say that's that's the, the that's the other joke we can make about uh the, the titles for the the DC movies. They're all they'll either be like volume 1 2 3 or they'll be like they'll be like The, the. Yeah, I know. I'm right? saying, like, I mean, that's I'm, how I'm pretty sure it. the Superman movie probably be called like The Man of Steel or something like that. I would be surprised. So <laughs> Exactly. Uh so I'm this is here what you I'm interested to hear what you want to do with Wonder Woman cuz I I'm mm. not quite sure. Okay, so this is set in modern time. Um, okay. It's not a period piece because even though that's a great idea and I feel like that's so synonymous with Gal Gadot's version of Wonder yeah. Woman. Yeah. You know, and there are so there are so many points of history where you could easily do a great story of origin or, or whatever with Wonder Woman. But I feel like they're going to try to, if if they're doing another Wonder Woman film and it's not, gal gadot's version um uh, it's got to be a bit more uh, dy not dynamic but it should be contemporary in a way you know be yeah because you know we haven't really seen much of that uh so this is <laughs> the wonder woman 
2027. So just okay. we only got one year, one movie at a time, bro. Yeah, keep, keep not them, 17. Keep them hooked. Keep them hooked. <laughs> uh, so it's Wonder also Warner Brothers can probably only afford to put one of these movies out a year. Thank God. Thank goodness. Um, that's yeah. Like if there's another DC film within the year of 2026, it's probably say like I don't know, Joker you know three or something i don't know oh god no don't say who that. knows who knows don't say that <laughs> um it's it's going to be stuff that's outside the universe um Probably. okay so wonder woman in this is an emissary for the amazons the amazons are discovered because we're in a world of surveillance there's no way that they are not going to be found out so she is out there essentially kind of doing in her own way pr she's going to U the un and she's uh, helping with uh, uh treaties between countries and warring nations and stuff not you know through violent means but through diplomatic means and sure. uh she has another country that contacts her and she gets in contact with and it's one that is is isolated and very uh mysterious and mythic in a way and it okay. is the, the kingdom of atlantis okay interesting yeah. i would say i i figured it was going to be like conduct or something but okay i like where this is going so uh yeah so by the way the uh james gunn by the way has said that his one of his main inspirations for this DC stuff is the animated Bruce Tim universe. Yeah. And one thing that was brilliant about those shows that they did was they used the shows to introduce other parts of the world. So like Superman, uh, the adventure, the, the animated series of Superman had Aquaman in there, Green Lantern, the flash and everything. Yeah. You know? Um, so that's kind of the, the idea here, you know? So she meets with, the Atlanteans meets with Aquaman. Arthur is the king, and he's oh. very much like he is similar to Namor, except that he has a more personal human tie uh, because yeah. of his his father's uh, relationship. But he doesn't talk to his father. His father's you know an asshole and everything. I would um, say uh, Arthur is not nearly as hateful a person as uh, as Namor. No, but he he's he's still a dick in this. <laughs> he's still a bit of a dick, and he has a and, and he has a a hook hand. I'm sorry, we got to go in that direction. Got to give him the hook hand. Save save that for later. Save for later. I, go on, go on. I still say well, save that for later. He's a dick. Um. So he's uh. So they're getting to talking and everything, but the cultures are pitted against each other. And everyone's wondering what the hell is going on? How is this happening? Why are we on the brink of war now? We're about to turn into a Flashpoint esque World War Three. I was going to say this is very Flashpoint, but it's it's revealed that they're uh, manipulated through outside forces, uh, an outside uh, monarch that wants the uh, to kind of mer getting rid of the uh, uh, the heads of the countries and adopt almost the uh, the cultures and weaponry and land of both the Atlanteans and Amazons and it because it's it's Count Vertigo who's from okay. his country who has who so we have the idea of um ownership of land you know like where um <laughs> it's a it's gonna be a bad example that i'm gonna bring up but when like uh uh he, <laughs> people find out their ancestry were like slave owners and they're sure. like so i get the the plantation right like i get that land you know what i mean there's like that type of loophole with count mm -hmm. vertigo where he's like well atlantis is within my borders where where it's placed i shouldn't that be part of my land shouldn't that be part of my and you know that kind How of thing are you happens do this though, because isn't because isn't count vertigo's country in like eastern europe or something uh just just move atlantis move atlantis it's 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 within the purview don't worry about it don't think about okay it. okay don't think about right. it. so we got I'm, we got I'm a little open. bit of a displacement uh theory happening with uh that and then aquaman and wonder woman have to uh come together and uh there's an alliance broke and war is staved off at least for now so we okay. have both wonder woman and aquaman set up in this phase that's 2027 it's a nice way of setting aquaman up without giving him his own solo movie yeah okay so the next year once again one one year at a time my friend is 2028 
And we have, believe it or not, Batman and Robin. Okay. So Batman is obviously an established vigilante. He's not, uh, he's, he's very much like um, the way we look at Phoenix Jones, let's say, in that, oh, it's just some nut in a mask who goes around, you know, he's just like, okay, he's there, but he's not like Superman, where that's in a world changing event. You know, Batman's been around for a couple of years and people tolerate him and everything. But then Robin, he gets a new new sidekick, a, a very recent Robin was included and people are starting to be like, what the hell? Uh, so the dynamic duo is looking into the League of Assassins exporting from Ace Chemicals. Ra- right. uh, Ra's al Ghul is developing a new Lazarus pit. And uh, so the the significance of this Lazarus pit is that you don't need to be dipped multiple times. You just need the one dip. And then at that point, you'll be good forever, essentially. And uh, they're, they're looking into the case and they they find out and they fight the League of Assassins. We get a couple lower tier Batman villains like uh, Professor Pig. Uh, we get to see uh, I-, I would love to see Kite Man. <laughs> you know <laughs> you know if you're going to bring in robin at some point you need to bring a little bit of levity and the villains can help with that uh right. so this pretty much sets up that batman is there batman has a robin and uh, th- i think the inclusion of robin helps us believe more that batman would join a justice league sure. at some point uh so that happens and it's then revealed in the post credit scene that one of the investors of Raish's project in getting the chemicals and everything, and and this investor wanted to uh, uh, take advantage of the Lazarus project, is Lex Luthor. I didn't say I figured Lex Luthor. Yeah. God, God damn it. Okay. <laughs> so in the same year of 2028, multiple projects, actually, okay. we now have not a film. We have the first season of a show. Okay. And the show is The Green Arrow. Okay. Now, so here's here's the interesting thing about The Green Arrow show. The Green Arrow is an older superhero. So he's and he's like a complete uh, he's kind of jovial and his he, he's used to it. He's very similar to Batman in that he's a little established except he's just a little bit older because he's one of these, you know, left-wing hippies out there, you know, spouting, like getting angry about crime. And whenever he fights a a burglar, he starts ranting them about the political climate and everything and the socioeconomic, like, man, if, you know, he's going all, going all libertard on them, essentially. Um, But one of the cool things about this show is that with each season, Green Arrow teams up uh, with a different hero. So okay. the first season, he teams up with The Flash. And we get okay. a, a nice little buddy cop almost type deal. You know, I for so each season he has a different uh, superhero that he can kind of understand and get to know. Um, in the second season, it would I- ideally be the Black Canary. The third season would be the Green Lantern. And the okay. fourth season, which is ideally the last season, would be Speedy, Arsenal, the Red Arrow. So you're... you're... Oh, let's see. How old are you imagining that Oliver is in this? Because you're saying he's older. He's he's thinking... a little. He'd probably be like early forties, you know. Okay. And if if we're lo- if we're looking at say like an athlete, that's old, you know. Yeah, it's not insanely old for a superhero, but you know he's he's uh, not as young as he used to be when he started doing this. Okay, interesting. Yeah. I would love to see a Green Arrow film, and if they do that, it'll be awesome. Um, I just know that they brought. They said that they were going to do more shows and everything, and yeah, G- Green Arrow is a great character to do a show of. Obviously, you know they yeah. did the show forever, but this wouldn't go as long as that, you know, by any means. Um, okay, now we're going to twenty twenty nine. Actually, all okay. right, all right. The next, the film. This is a film. It serves as a sequel to two films in the earlier from this phase it is batman superman world's finest okay so this is essentially batman 2 and superman 2 yeah it's where we start to get into the the major crossovers 
and where we get to see them it's a proto justice league if you will but it's just right. batman and superman it's not you're not going to get wonder woman or anything like you know what happened with donna justice so uh. <laughs> so the premise of this and it's much more small in scale uh, in terms yeah. of like conflict and all that uh, a big example and inspiration for this pitch is the uh, batman and superman movie they did in the continuity say... of uh, the timverse as it were yeah, the animated one. I didn't say I had a feeling, probably. That's a great one. All right. So Batman and Superman meet when a ship crashes into Gotham holding uh, Kal-El's cousin Kara. Lex Luthor comes into town to build an anti-alien arsenal, kind of tying back into what was going on with Batman and Robin. Uh, he wants... Excuse me. He wants to use Kara, so he manipulates her. She's very naive because she's new to Earth and she doesn't understand the nuances of human lying. And okay. Batman and Superman have to come together to save Supergirl, essentially. And then we have a tease to the next film. And that tease in this is why Kara was shot away and where Kara is coming from. So we get I'm to sorry. see... We so we get to see Kara's perspective of Krypton being destroyed, right. and it's due to the interference of an alien creature known as Brainiac. I was gonna say Brainiac, yeah. So now we're in 2030, and the next film is a Green Lantern film. Okay. Because without a doubt, I kn I already know they're gonna do Green Lantern. Yeah. I mean, James Gunn is the perfect example as to why Green Lantern can work with Guardians of the Galaxy. All right. So it's 2030. It's Green Lantern time. And the Green Lantern we're focusing on is Jon Stewart. He's the newest recruit of the Green Lantern Corps on OA. Uh, he, his, uh, his uh, superior officer, his partner, as it were, it's very much like training day. I like that you brought that up. Um, yeah. It's Hal Jordan. Hal Jordan is his mentor teaching him the ropes a little bit so they patrol the galaxy they go to different planets uh and they fight hacked in manhunters manhunters are the uh the robot uh kind of police presence developed by yeah, the, the green lanterns they were the predecessors of the green lanterns and i guess uh were actually inspired by the martian police yeah. force um hence marching i mean this is obviously retroactive continuity but yeah yeah so the Manhunters are kind of rogue. There's a squad of them that's going around and harassing planets and all, in some cases destroying planets. And uh, the Green Lanterns have to go stop them. And they investigate why they are being rogue, like what's going on with them. And the finale of the film or the finale, <laughs> the re revelation of the film is that they were hacked in by Brainiac and we're okay. building Brainiac up, Brainiac up more. And Brainiac comes to Oa, the planet of the Green Lanterns. He shrinks and abducts the main city of Oa. And okay. so this includes the Guardians, Green Lanterns, and Hal himself. John is the only one left. And he finds out that Brainiac is headed to Earth. And this is what prompts John to go back to Earth and speed on okay. Earth. And, and this is what leads us back, still in 2030, later half to the Justice League film. Okay. So in this, it's a team of superheroes. They are forced to come together to fight the evil Brainiac. And in this, the team is Superman, Batman, Wonder Woman, The Flash, Green Arrow, Aquaman, and Green Lantern. And they fight. And to clarify with The Flash, it's is it Barry or Wally? Uh, it's Barry. Okay. It's Barry. Because in later, uh, later half, I want to bring in the... Uh, wally west along with uh speedy and everything and robin's there in a later say, phase you can get the teen titans i was gonna say because i'm assuming you're built into the teen titans okay okay yes right. and uh yeah so that's the team they fight they beat brainiac they come together the, the justice league and um yeah that's the first phase right it was fun and then nothing else after justice league yeah uh, no, Justice League would be like very much what the Avengers was for the first phase of the Marvel stuff, you okay. know, where it's it's what we were building up to. And then we go on from there. Okay, interesting. 
All right. Yeah. I just say it's interesting to see the overlap between uh between our stuff. And say I'm, I have to assume that some of the some similar ideas are going through uh through Gun's head, especially with like um with like the Superman and the um, and the the Green Lantern stuff because we both kind of went to similar places with that. Mm-hmm. Um. Yeah. Let me say, do you have ideas for um, do you have ideas for like what who you would want to see as like the because obviously with um, Marvel you have the phases, but then you have like the overarching sagas. Do you have yeah. an idea of who you would want to be the villain of that first? I mean, we'll just use MCU term terminology. Who you want to be the villain of the first saga? Uh, yeah. So I mean, I'd imagine it being Dark Side. I mean, that's the obvious, you know, because what Thanos did for Marvel, Dark Side, Dark Side could easily do for DC. Um, but I know that uh, Gunn was teasing the idea of doing Kingdom Come in some way, you know. Well, I think I think it's more like I don't I don't know because I know he posted that photo to his yeah I remember if it was Instagram or Twitter or whatever. I think it, it was feels more like. I think it, I don't know. I have a hard time believing that 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 was like him, like oh, we're gonna do something like Kingdom Come. I feel like it's more like yeah, that maybe. Was, I mean, I'm sure. I'm sure that they will probably do a storyline like that at some point. It makes mm-hmm. sense. Um, I don't know. I don't know. Anyways, but continue. So you were saying Dark yeah, Side. So I mean, Dark Side would be cool. What's funny about this is that I adopted a lot of the ideas I had for a podcast I wanted to do a couple years ago when I was doing that. I, I don't know if you know, but I did the these videos about uh, how I would do the X-Men, the Fantastic Four and everything, and then ultimately, you know, what it, what it became. Um, I was asked, like, what would you do for DC? And I was writing ideas and everything and, and what I would want if I were the doing that what would i do um so there was a lot of uh overlap with those ideas to this and trying to kind of merge them with reality versus what i would want to see and do um but i'd imagine that dark side you'd want to build up to dark side right you know and the anti-life equation especially if you're taking inspiration from like justice league and justice league unlimited you know the finality they did there was spectacular I was saying they give they give Lex a really great send off too. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, and his obsession with Brainiac and everything, you know, it's really good. They should just do that. <laughs> and you say also, um, also the way they weave in, um, not Metamorpho. Um, who's the robot? <laughs> uh, Metron. No, 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 no. From um, the New Gods. No, the um, the. The robot who basically becomes Doctor Manhattan. Um, becomes Doctor Manhattan. Name? Amazo. Oh, Amazo. That's right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And say I'd be interested to see if they bring him in as well because they do a really good job of uh, implement of implementing his character in uh in the DCAU as well. So I'd yeah. Be interested to see them do that. I yeah. I definitely think that with with all of this, the first phase at least, it should be much smaller in terms of yeah. the scale um there are so many like there's a tapestry there are tapestries upon tapestries upon tapestries of characters that you can do um i hope that for the whatever it is they do with the dcu whatever it is that james gunn announces i, I i'm curious if you agree i was looking at it like after 2020 where we had the worst year in in our recent lives we were hoping the next year would just kind of be chill that is yeah (laughs) yeah just like nothing too eventful you know i'm just hoping for something a bit chill you know i I don't tell me what you think of this i'm hoping that gun kind of keeps it basic and doesn't really get into a lot of the weird lesser known characters that he likes to yeah. and gets the main ones right. Well, I was say I think you can you can get into the lesser known characters, but I think that those characters are going to be maybe more appropriate for TV. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. So I don't know. Um, I would say on the thing of going small though, this is why I would actually steer away from Dark Side, especially because um 
Thanos, I think, is still so fresh in people's minds. Yes. Um, I would actually, what I would actually do, and this maybe is the problem with this is this kind of ends up retreading similar areas Thanos as well, unfortunately. But I would actually, <laughs> what I would love to see is a team up of Ra's al Ghul and Vandal Savage. Oh man, Vandal Savage would be great. Which oh, I know man. he's technically more of a JSA villain, but he has fought the JLA before. I mean, yeah, I I, I really want to see. I mean, granted, um, the battle storyline I think originally used um, Ross, but I want I would love to see some kind of um, some adaptation of the battle storyline with much later down, much later on in the universe have like adapt Babel is basically your version of the civil war of captain america civil war yeah um yeah and use yeah like have have Roz and van will be the ultimate villains of that first arc because they have very similar goals um, that's that's a really interesting idea you know i man there's so much more i would like to get into i mean you you know i like to get into the nitty grit gritty of these uh stories and everything and and there's a lot more that i've i've written past this but um you know we're not gonna do that right now i i, I think no. we're just both hoping um when the time comes to nerd out we can nerd out uh properly and yes. enjoyably yeah <laughs> actually is there anything uh lastly you want to say before we wrap it up regarding uh anything comics uh the dc stuff um Uh, nothing except I want to reiterate my desire for a uh, Ted Cord Booster Gold question team up movie. That would be awesome. I want I want a wacky time traveling team up movie with those three. It would be wonderful. I agree. I I would like to see that and get throw Huntress in there. Yeah. Honestly, honestly, the other thing I would love to see again is because I love the Charlton characters just do a just do a movie with all the Charlton characters or like a TV show. <laughs> it'd be fun. Yeah, it'd be, I would love that. What would you call it? Um, the Charlton. Well, so they, I they actually had um their own series DC. I think initially they have tried to keep them together in a single um in a single title. Um, just call it um just name it after the, the comic book series um Law Living Assault Weapons. Oh, that's pretty cool. I like that. Right? That's yeah, I like name. that. <laughs> Living assault. You know, well, very quickly before we wrap it up, there was a point in the Doomsday Clock where they were all grouped up together when they're headed to Mars. It's just like, oh, here are the, here are the Charlton characters. I was say, yeah. <laughs> all right. Actually, yeah, hey, man, th thanks for uh, talking to me about this comic stuff. We tolerate them. Of course. Thank you for inviting me. All right, brother. I'll see you soon. Uh, I'm going to end the thing now. And uh, thanks again. I'll let you know when this is coming out. Yes. And uh, all right. DC. I'm, I'm going to go get some blueberry. Or no, blueberry. Strawberry daiquiris. DC these nuts. Nuts. <laughs> all, right. all right, man. Cheers. Salud. <laughs>